Thank you for the very kind introduction. I hope everyone can uh, hear me clearly. If not, um, please let me know, uh, and I can always increase my, my volume if needed. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at the Vant workshop. Um, I hope I can join you guys in person in a beautiful um, Vancouver. Okay, I'm glad uh, you can hear me well. So today I'm going to talk about um, how do we handle data distribution shift in the wild? And this is a problem that's really close to my heart. Um, can the audience in the room hear me clearly? Or do I need to further increase my volume? Let me know. Cool. So I want to start the talk by um, showing you this video. This is a model trained on the um, Berkeley Deep Drive uh, 100K data set performing bonding box tracking um, on the road. And whenever we see videos like this, it's very easy to be amazed by these seemingly powerful capabilities that modern neural networks have um, demonstrated. And in my research, I encourage researchers and practitioners to look at the other side as well, um, especially be aware of unexpected situations that the model wasn't trained for. And so hopefully by the end of the talk, um, we can see things in a more well-rounded perspective. And so now imagine you're the head of AI um, at, this Tesla at this company called Tesla. My question for the audience is how would you approach building and deploy such a self-driving car model. And to abstract the process, we typically start with collecting the training data, um, where each data point is individually annotated with some um, labels. And then we would train on our favorite machine learning model, say a neural network. Here, the output typically contains some predefined categories. In this case, we have pedestrian, car, truck, and traffic light, and so on. And so let's say once you've finally navigated through all the challenges and have a model with decent performance that you think it's ready to be deployed, this is where some of the unexpected trouble would start to happen. And the reason I say that because the classic machine learning assumption, as all of you have um, probably know, is this um, IID assumption, where the training and test data distributions are sampled from the same underlying distribution. However, this uh, rarely holds true in the real world, where training and test data distributions can be wildly different, and lots of unknowns could emerge. For example, um, in a recent work, uh, my PhD student Shufon took this um, image from the MS Coco dataset. And then we run through this self-driving car model that was just trained on BDD. And interestingly, you can see that the model would produce overconfident predictions for this, uh, this unknown object, helicopter right in the middle, to be a truck. And keep in mind that this helicopter was never exposed to the model during training time. So in other words, deep neural networks do not necessarily know what they don't know. And this has raised significant concerns on models safety and reliability. As you can imagine, if a machine learning algorithm just blindly classify these out of distribution samples into one of the irrelevant, um, nonetheless known classes, it can be catastrophic. And ideally, we want the model to be able to flag such scenario um, to say something like, hey, this is something I don't know, so that human can take better precautions. And this kind of example can have um, real consequences in real life. Um, for example, I'm quoting this news article from April last year, which reported that a Tesla vehicle uh, using this um, smart summer mode uh, crashed into this private jet. And so what's happening in this video, which is public available on YouTube and the internet, is that this white car is driving towards the, the, this blue jet. And then this blue jet starts spinning around. And so obviously this kind of um, lack of ability to recognize unknown can have a real consequences. 
And so this out of distribution detection problem has uh, become very, very important. And so this is going to be the focus of my talk today. So what is out of distribution data? Uh, let me first provide a simple definition for this problem. Let's say we have our training data distribution, um, which is a mixture of um, two Gaussians in this case in two dimensional space um, with two class labels, y equals to one and minus one. And so our in distribution ID data would be the marginal of the joint distribution defined over the input space X. So in other words, it's what the screen contour highlights. And in testing, these orange dots would emerge, which are out of distribution from an unknown class that doesn't belong to either y equals to one or minus one, and therefore should not be predicted by this classifier. And to translate this toy example into some high dimensional images, um, you can think of Cypher 10 on the left hand side being the in distribution and SVHN uh, being the OOD, which have disjoint labels. Um, well, I know you might be thinking this example um, might be too trivial, at least for human eyes. Um, but in fact, it actually took the community a couple of years to make meaningful progress um, on this benchmark. And when we started working on this um, problem a few years ago, the error that an OOD detector can make can, can be actually um, above 50%. Um, so it was um, actually considered a quite challenging problem back then. Um, but of course, we'll talk about you know, how some of the progress is made along the way. Um, so SVHN is just one of the OOD that the model would encounter. And there are, of course, many other unknowns on this um, data manifold. And if you look at the slide from OpenAI, um, which I think very nicely um, captures the complexity of the problem, the right-hand side would contain all the possible images one could generate and encounter on the internet. And this is in sharp contrast to the left-hand side, which is often a very task-specific data set, um, say Cypher 10. And so out of distribution detection is um, a hard problem. And I would like to just use a few slides to, um, to explain the why um, before getting into the solution. So the first challenge is the lack of supervision from unknowns during training time. Our classifier typically is trained only on the green and um, on the in distribution data, in this case, the green and blue dots um, using empirical risk minimization. And you can't really anticipate where these orange dots would emerge in advance because there can be a huge space of unknowns, especially in the high dimensional space. And the problem is further exacerbated um, by these high capacity neural networks that we're working with nowadays, um, which can almost perfectly fit a data set or in distribution data set given in hand, but it would produce ill fated decision boundary, which can't be reliably used for distinguishing ID versus OOD data. And to explain what I mean, um, I want to share you know, one of my favorite toy examples here to get the point across. So now let's consider our in-distribution data, which is a mixture of three Gaussians with class label one, one, two, and three here. And it turns out, if you just take a very simple neural network, it doesn't even have to be convolutional, it doesn't have to be transformers. You, you just take a simple multilayer perceptron and you can fit this uh, data set almost perfectly to perform this classification um, problem. And if you look at the decision boundary, um, despite this separation among the three classes, this decision boundary has some problem. Um, when you look at those red regions, for example, those corresponds to um, data points that are far away from our in distribution, uh, which are the three cl gray clusters. Um, but nonetheless, they're, they're inducing a relatively high um, output score um, by this neural network and therefore is classified as one of those in distribution um, 
classes, right? It was was high confidence, and so obviously this is not very desirable um, from OOD detection perspective. And so I'll talk about how we um, get around some of these challenges and issues later in my talk. And another challenge that I want to highlight is that real world images are composed of uh, numerous objects and components. And therefore, we need finer grained understanding of OOD at the object level, um, going beyond just the image level. And over the years, we have seen this um, surge of interest in this challenging problem space. Um, really, it's great to see this uh, thriving literature on um, OOD detection. And two years ago, my uh, collaborators and I have started this effort of composing a comprehensive survey, uh, which attempt to cover um, the methodologies developed in the space. Um, I won't be getting into all of them, but I'll, I'll try to unpack um, some of those in this talk. So first, I want to uh, start with a method overview. Um, here, a model is typically trained on the in-distribution data, um, say, in this case, Cypher 10, using empirical risk minimization. And once the network is trained, let's take the network as it is um, without modifying its parameters. And so during inference time, for any given input x, we're going to devise a scoring function um, s for OOD detection. And so essentially, we're performing some level set estimation. If it's below certain threshold, we're going to reject this input as OOD. And otherwise, um, we will produce the class prediction um, as usual. Um, for the ID data. And this problem is uh, different from anomaly detection, which a lot of audience um, are uh, a lot of audience are familiar with, which is a classic problem in machine learning um, that often treat all the data as uh, one class without necessarily differentiating the class labels. And so here we're interested in both um, classifying the in distribution uh, data as well as performing ID OOD classification. And so an interesting question you can ask is, how do we define the out of distribution scoring function? Um, and this question has really driven a very rich line of works, uh, including our own. Um, for example, um, a common baseline is to use the softmax confidence score, um, which is defined to be the largest posterior probability, or if you prefer to call the maximum softmax confidence score, um, the definition is given um, in this equation here. However, if we zoom into this, um, you know, this, this region highlighted in this red circle, uh, we notice that this maximum softmax probability uh, can be non-distinguishable or highly overlapping between the ID data in purple and OOD data, um, which is in gray. And so this phenomenon is related to the fact that Neural networks can produce overconfident predictions on OOD data. And I've already um, showed you one of the um, cases using the 3D um, toy example. Um, and in fact, um, this, uh, this scoring function is um, suboptimal for OOD um, detection. And fast forward uh, in 2020, we put forward an energy based out of distribution detection framework. Um, which has the core idea um, that really um, drives some of our recent works and other researchers um, as well. And compared to the confidence score, um, we showed that energy score is better suited for the purpose of OOD detection. And so to give you a high level view, uh, we have this input X um, that goes into this neural network parameterized by theta. And then we would calculate this energy score um, and I'll talk about the definition in the next few slides. And once we have this energy score, we can again performing this um, thresholding comparison um, or level set estimation based on this, this score. Um, just to note that here, I flipped this uh, the sign of energy. So to align with the convention, um, that higher score indicates more ID-ness and vice versa. Um, but usually, um, ID data have. Um, smaller energy. Um, so the negative would result in the larger score. 
So energy-based model was first introduced to machine learning community around 80s, and it has been around for decades. Um, so that's a really long time. And to give you some background, uh, an energy function would take an input X, um, say my cat, and then the corresponding label Y. It would then go through this function um, and produce a scalar called energy. Um, you can think of this as a measurement of compatibility between the input and the label, and it should give a lower value if it's compatible in this case. So if we change the label to be, in this case, to be a rabbit, right, the energy in this case should be higher. And so this function can be non-probabilistic. And if you want to turn this into a probability density, um, you can do so using um, the well-known Gibbs distribution um, as shown in this equation here. So again, uh, let's look at this, let's look at this Gibbs distribution here, um, which would uh, allow us to derive these posterior probability P of Y condi conditioned on this input X. And if we look at this denominator here, which is also known as the partition function, it basically takes the integral over all the possible uh, Y states. By equalizing these two sides, uh, this free energy is defined um, to be the negative of the log partition function. And this is the standard notion that has been around in physics for a long time. So how is this energy-based model related to neural networks? That's the interesting question um, that we can unpack here. It turns out a neural-based classifier can be interpreted from an energy-based perspective. And so if we consider this neural network that's producing output logit, F1, um, F2 all the way to Fy, um, and so on. And all of these logits are basically scalar, um, not probabilistic, and you can normalize them um, into meaningful probability distributions through the softmax function. And this is um, hopefully the audience is really familiar with the softmax definition um, to enable this normalization. So now let's consider this, um, you know, energy e of x comma y to be the negative of this logit output. So if we plug in this replacement, effectively this turns into something that we just saw earlier, right? So you see this symmetry uh, between the left versus the, the, the right side. And recall this is how free energy is defined. Um, previously, in the context of uh, neural network, the free energy replaces this integral with summations over k discrete classes. And so now for every input x and a pre-trained neural network parameterized by, um, by uh, defined as f, um, this energy function can be easily computed using this log sum uh, exponential function. So with energy scores, um, the distribution become uh, much more separable between the ID versus OOD. And um, as I mentioned, uh, we uh, negate the sign here just to align with the condition that larger score indicates more ID-ness and vice versa. And so in this slide, I also put these two definitions uh, for both softmax score and energy score on the same slide so, so that we can see the probabilistic interpretation um, side by side. And so the first line is the definition of um, where softmax is based on, right? That's the posterior probability P of Y condition on X. Um, where if you look at the energy score, um, it really captures the negative log of the denominator in the softmax function. And interestingly, if you decompose this pro posterior probability uh, as the division between the joint probability divided by this likelihood, um, P of X, and you see that energy function has an inherent connection to the log likelihood. It's not exactly equivalent, but I'll show you how we build on this to design a loss function that can exploit this connection later on. So to evaluate and compare these two different scoring functions, um, we trained a model on Cypher 10 as in distribution and then evaluated on SVHN um, as OOD. And so the evaluation metric is uh, called FPR, 
um, which essentially chooses the threshold based on this ID data, right? All the Cypher 10 data so that 95% of the samples are above this threshold. And then we go back and see based on the threshold, what's the fraction of OOD data that's misclassified as ID. And we want this FPR 95 to be lower. Um, so lower is the better. Um, so if we're using softmax score, um, it turns out um, separating these two data set is not as easy as, as, as we think. Um, and the error rate is around 50% um, in this case. And if we use the same neural network, same parameterization, but change the score definition to be energy, um, and we see this drastic reduction in terms of um, FPR to 35%. Um, and um, we tested on a broader range of um, other data sets other than Cypher 10. Um, and we consistently observed this significant improvement. So far, I have um, talked quite a bit about scoring function. Um, but these are only part of the solution um, to this out of distribution detection problem. And in my opinion, uh, mitigating OOD risk really requires us to rethink um, the design of the learning algorithms um, from the get-go, um, instead of just from a post-hoc testing time perspective. And to explain what I mean, let's revisit this example. Um, here, the model is trained to using the standard um, ERM with cross-entropy loss on the ID data, right? So those three gray clusters, and you notice, right, this decision boundary is sufficient for um, ID classification, but they're far from sufficient for um, OOD detection purposes. And this is because the existing learning algorithms have been primarily driven to optimize accuracy only on the ID data. And they don't have this incentive to account for the uncertainty from outside um, these um, training data. And so going beyond the standard ERM, um, we really need um, this training time regularization that explicitly account for uncertainty um, outside the ID data, right? So the ideal decision boundary should, um, should be something like the right-hand side, um, which is not only differentiating among the three in distribution classes, but are more well aligned with the underlying uh, data density so that we can perform reliable OOD detection. And so the question is, how do we go from the left to the right hand side without having to perform density estimation? Uh, because in high dimensional space, that's a very, very challenging uh, problem to estimate P of X. And to do so, we, um, we put forward this um, uh, due objectives. Um, which is a combination of standard cross entropy loss, which minimize the risk on the um, on the ID data. And additionally, we have this uncertainty regularization term that tries to uh, differentiate ID versus OOD data. So now let's zoom into this um, the right set, the right hand side, uh, which is more interesting. Okay, so now let's assume we have access to some auxiliary outlier training data. Um, and our idea is to explicitly push the energy score to be a part, to be as separable as possible between the ID, which is in purple here, versus the OOD data in gray. And this objective has um, some nice mathematical interpretation too. Um, recall that um, energy is um, has this nice connection to the negative log of um, likelihood. And so essentially we're performing a level set estimation based on this measurement, right, related to this log likelihood. But the nice thing here is this optimization objective is much simpler than density estimation, uh, which requires us to accurately estimate uh, P of X for every single data point, but as here, um, it's a simpler objective, which um, only aims to perform the, the level set um, estimation. 
And so from an optimization perspective, it's, it's much easier. And the result of the training is uh, more separable distributions uh, measured by this, uh, by this energy score on the rightmost side. And so you can see that FPR can be uh, further reduced down to uh, 1%. And so this is a lot more promising compared to when we just take the model trained with cross entropy loss as shown in the middle. So this is all promising, um, but this framework um, has one um, caveat along with all the other works that requires um, auxiliary um, outlier training data. And so the question is, where do we even collect those data from, right? So we, we can't really take those for granted. In practice, collecting this large outlier data can be arguably expensive. Um, moreover, this manual data collection and cleaning needs to be repeated for different ID data set because you have to make sure that this auxiliary outlier data, whatever you're using, shouldn't overlap with your ID data. And so you can see this is not a very uh, scalable or flexible methods. And so we asked this question, is there any way um, to generate OOD data um, automatically for free? Um, so we answered this question in our um, iClear paper um, from last year um, called Virtual Outlier Census, um, uh, which really kind of uh, introduced this, uh, this notion. Um, and when we're working on this project, um, one of the, I would say, natural idea when it comes to census would be adopt um, generative-based models for image uh, generation. Um, but the challenge there is it can be um, intractable when it comes to synthesizing high-resolution uh, images. And so our key idea to, is to synthesize outliers instead of in the visual pixel space, um, but move towards this feature space. And this suits our purpose because we care more about regularizing the model's decision boundary. And to give you a kind of overview, I won't go into uh, much extensive details here. Um, what we do is to first model this feature representation space, in this case, the penultimate layer um, in the neural network, um, in this case, as a class conditional multivariate Gaussian distribution. And so the mean and covariance metrics can be um, estimated on this empirical data sets. And then we can sample the virtual outliers uh, from this low likelihood region based on the, the Gaussian distribution that we just estimated, right? We have this mu hat um, and then the sigma hat all available, so you can compute this likelihood score explicitly. And we can do this for each of the class in our ID data set. Um, for example, this three clusters corresponds to different classes in the embedding space, and the dark points are the synthesized outliers. And now the interesting part is you can take these synthesized virtual outliers, um, which have the same dimensionality as the penultimate layer, and then pass them through this fully connected layer and obtain this output um, through a linear transformation. And this weight is shared uh, between the ID and OOD data. And so once you have this output, um, then the energy score can be computed um, by plugging in this definition, uh, which relies on this logit output. Now, putting everything together, um, this is this entire um, learning framework, which basically has two terms. Um, the first term is uh, minimizing the classific classification error on the ID data. And the second term is um, the level set estimation, separating ID versus the synthesized OOD data in terms of the energy score. So VOS is a, a general learning framework that is suitable for both um, image classification and you can use it for object detection as well. Um, in this case, um, you would have to um, add a cert term to the learning objective, which performs the, the bonding box localization. Um, but the the same underlying idea for the uncertainty regularization still holds. To give you um, an example of how it works, um, recall that this is an image that I shared earlier on in this talk um, where we have this helicopter that's uh, misclassified 
um, not correctly recognized as OOD. Um, and this was a model faster or CNN that was trained on the uh, BDD uh, data set. And in contrast, if we retrain this um, object detection model by plug in this virtual outlier census and then the regularization term, um, this network has a better chance of recognizing these unknown object and, and flag them. So this is nice. Um, but admittedly, when um, we're working on VOS, um, one of the limitation, of course, is the distribution assumption that we um, made on the feature embedding space. And we mitigated this in our um, follow-up work, um, which we presented at um, just at iClear this year, um, called non-parametric um, outlier census. Um, and this is joint work with um, uh, Lei Tian and my PhD student, Xu Feng, and uh, my colleague, uh, Jerry Zhu. Um, I won't go into the details, um, but this is a, a really nice framework that allows us to sample virtual outliers without making any distributional assumption about the feature embedding. And so you can use this method for embedding of any geometry, um, which has stronger um, generality and, and flexibility. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check out this, uh, this work um, if you're interested. I think for the uh, in the interest of time, uh, I might skip um, four slides to keep the program on time. I noticed it's already 11.10, and I do want to make sure that uh, we don't delay this program further. So just to summarize this talk, um, you know, hopefully I have, um, you know, give you some idea about the, the interesting um, challenges um, and progress that we've made. Um, in this uh, fun problem space. Um, and a key message um, that I want to share through this talk is that we really need to think beyond um, just designing you know, scoring functions from a um, test time perspective. Um, what's really fundamental in terms of mitigating this out of distribution risk is um, to rethink how we um, train these machine learning models from the get-go. Um, and so it's important to go beyond this um, cross entropy loss by explicitly um, account for these uncertainty uh, from outside the ID data. Um, and I have given you one example, um, which the OOD aware learning is quite promising to provide both um, classification accuracy um, and safety performance in terms of when it comes to um, out of distribution data. And so with that, I would like to end the talk here. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for questions still. I would leave that to the to the workshop chairs. Um, thank you. Um, excuse me, Lotha, I just want to let you know I, I couldn't hear anything from the room. Oh, yeah, I was saying thank you, Dr. Shen, and uh, sorry for the technical mistake. Uh, we'll take a couple of minutes for questions now. Uh, any inputs to our questions can please come into the microphone here. Okay, hi. Uh, hope everyone can hear me well. Um, so, first of all, uh, many thanks for the very clear um, overview that you've given. Um, I have a question regarding the virtual outlier system. So, since this happens during training, what happens if the in distribution data shifts? Do we then also degrade on the ability to detect like outlier classes? So, for an example, if we have something like, uh, I don't know, cars that are detected in summer and then we try to detect them in winter. And we apply the VUS, then we have a shift, and therefore the input distribution shifts. And does this affect the virtual outlier synthesis since it relies on the intermediate features? Thank you for that question. Um, so, if I recap your question, I think it, you raised a very interesting point, which is while we're applying this virtual outlier synthesis framework, what happens if we 
um, also experience um, some sort of covariance shift for the end distribution data, right? For example, the cars from, you know, like sunny weather to some winter condition. Um, am I recapping your question correctly? Oh, I really like that uh, because in the current DeVos framework, um, one of the, in our problem definition, uh, one of the implicit assumption that we've made is that the underlying ID data distribution is sort of, um, is sort of stationary um, and fixed. And for example, if we're considering this driving scenario, um, the underlying ID data, right, is sort of perceived to be um, consistent, even though we don't have this explicit P of X, but we're assuming it's not changing over time. But it would be a really interesting question um, to consider if the ID data also allows some sort of shifting, like covariance shift. In this case, the challenge, though, is as your ID data is also shifting, this boundary would also evolve over time. And so that would also mean as we're creating these virtual outliers, um, that embedding space would also have to be adapting, um, which condition on some timestamp T if this, uh, this ID data boundary um, changes over time. And we haven't considered this in, our, um, in this published work, but I think it will be a very interesting question to kind of investigate this time variant aspect. Thank you for that question. And thank you for confirming my answer. Hi there, I just took a quick scan through the ICLR 2023 paper and I, I couldn't find this, so forgive me if I just missed it, but uh, I see the results, which are very impressive for uh, like FAR OOD data, SVHN, LSUN, and so forth. Um, have you tested out just on, on near OOD, so you know, train on C4 and test on C4? 100 and, and if so, um, what is the performance like for those near OE cases? Oh, thank you for that question. I believe I'll have to double check on that. Uh, but in the paper, we primarily focus on these standard um, benchmarks um, where this notion of OD is relatively you know, um, well-defined. I think the challenge when it comes to near OD um, is that it's, it has this um, the boundary between defining your OOD versus the synthesized outliers is um, having less clear cut. And so that's one of the reasons we primarily focus on the, the far OOD. But um, I think, you know, thank you for raising that, uh, that question. I think that would be, you know, an interesting exploration as well. I think we have time for one last question. Hello, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, um, I may have missed this part in your presentation, but I, I see you have argued for uh, energy based uh, as opposed to, say, score based. Uh, and then afterwards, you have uh, argued for outlier synthesis. So I, I wonder whether um, which one of these two aspects uh, is more important, or whether you have quantitatively evaluated the importance of the two. I didn't quite catch the last part of your question. Do you mind repeating? I, um, I've heard uh, you proposing to use energy-based uh, models in the first part of your talk. And then we've seen uh, a couple of your works in uh, IQR 22 and 23 that argue for the outlier synthesis. So, so these are two, I guess, uh, two orthogonal aspects to different dimensions that you can explore. Have you actually, say, quantitatively um, evaluated the, the importance, for example, of uh, outliers uh, in a softmax score? Oh, I see your question. Um, so that's a great point. It's actually not orthogonal. If you look at this formulation of virtual outlier synthesis, um, we actually um, employ this notion of energy when we're optimizing for this learning objective, as you see here in this uh, equation um, down below. So basically, um, you can think of this as an explicit uh, binary classification defined in terms of um, energy score. Um, and this learner tries to separate the ID data versus the synthesized 
um, outliers in terms of the energy score, right? So we basically want all the virtual outliers to have positive energy and then for the ID data to have um, negative energy. And so um, hopefully that addresses your question of, you know, whether it's independent um, or orthogonal. So the question is, um, so th the answer is, you know, they can really be, uh, you know, in integral framework. Um, and the reason why energy is, um, you know, a nice option is, as I mentioned in this slide, it has, um, it has really nice interpretation um, from a likelihood perspective. Um, and so that's um, kind of one of the reasons we, you know, adopted this in a lot of our recent, uh, recent frameworks, as opposed to softmax score. Um, so, and uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. And evaluation, this is the primary score that uh, that boss is based upon. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. This is for the sake of time, I think we have to move on. Um, so thank you, Dr. Berndi, once more for giving the talk and for uh, taking all these interesting questions and answering them. So we will now ask the first spotlight center to the stage. Thank you. Um, yeah, now we have our first spotlight talk. Um, the paper is called uh, Are We Certain It's Anomalous? Um, I'm going to go on time series anomaly detection. I just believe where our new method called IPAP was um, introduced. Hi everyone, I'm Alessandro and I'm part of the Perception and Intelligence Lab of the University of Rome. And today I'm going to present you the paper that we uh, made that is our research and these ones. As uh, before, it is a paper about the anomaly detection of time series. And we have different sources of the time series. So we have binarical series, um, servers, uh, so data from the servers, uh, NASA. And uh, we have a new uh, data set about uh, medical data uh, that was taken uh, from elderly and using the sensor data. And then we also tested on a multivariate, uh, multivariate uh, data set that is what about the industrial way of further treatment. Um, yeah, anomaly detection uh, has an um, interesting uh, real world uh, problem. And where we train on the um, normal data, and then we have um, uh, anomalies only in the test data. So we have to uh, find out how to uh, handle these uh, uh, samples. Uh, so the open problems are that anomaly mean, detection is imposed due to this open set nature. And uh, the literature um, neglects um, to. to Assign like an uncertainty to the to identify the suppliers, and the uncertainty has not been fully explored. Um, there are some difficulties, as said in the previous talks, uh, to um, 
give a score for the uncertainty uh, during training, and so to so we'll learn the model uh, to have an end to end, uh, end of the driven uncertainty. So um, we have two different types of the anomaly detection systems. The first one that is in, on the top is uh, a color decoder um, structure and architecture where uh, we have an uh, input and we want to reconstruct it or generate something that is uh, similar. And so our anomaly um, score is the difference between the reconstruction and the input signal. Uh, then we can have also the um, an encoder based architecture where we have an input and then we map it in the, in the latter space. And uh, like using the DPT, for example, we can map it uh, close to a center so that in the test, in the, test um, uh, the testing phase, uh, the, um, the anomalies will be uh, really far from the center. Our um, model uh, is, um, has an encoder encoder architecture that I will show you now. And uh, our model is based on the best, the current best target. That is again, and uh, what is important is that uh, the anomaly score is given for the uh, by the extraction error that is distant between the input and the um, and the reconstructed one, and then this multiply also by our critic score that is used for our desired training, but it's not important for the discussion. Uh, so what we uh, propose is to use uh, the hyperbolic space. And so to uh, estimate the uncertainty of these centers that are in. Um, um, so uh, what we want is that when we have a reconstruction error, we want also that models uh, certain about what we are reconstructing. So uh, in this case, when uh, we are uh, uncertain, maybe we have some false positives, and so we want to get rid of them. So uh, what we what comes. Some yeah. um, so uh, with hyperbolic space, uh, we want to uh, minimize the error in this, uh, in this uh, hyperbolic space, and we do that by taking the two inputs, so x and x squared, if we can, and uh, uh, map them to the Poincare um, ball that is a manifold of the hyperbolic space. In this space, um, we are limited. Uh, we're, we're constrained between zero and one. So you um, also using the exponential map, we can go from the equilibrium space to hyperbolic space. And uh, here, C is the curvature of the space. And uh, why should we do that? Uh, it's, it's because in this space, uh, the, volume, so the volume is not constant as in the equilibrium one. But as we go far from the center, the volume increases exponentially. And uh, yeah, so um, if in the equilibrium space we use the norm to minimize the, dis the distance between the, um, the input and the reconstruction in the proper small, we have to use the, the metric of the, of the space that is the boundary distance. And as we can see on the, the top of the right, um, in the, the equilibrium distance between H and H tweedle and H and the H to first is the same, but in the hyperbolic space, the um, the distance between H and the H to first is uh, a lot smaller because as we go to, uh, near close to the edge of the sphere, the sphere, the um, the loss is exponentially larger. So, um, um, yeah. Uh, so the models prefer to uh, to keep the the value. Closer to the the center of the ball, if it's uncertain. How we measure the uncertainty is to take the norm of the value. So the norm of the value is the, the uncertainty of the, of the center. And the anomaly score we discovered that using uh, the reconstruction error that is given by the concurrent distance times the um, grid score and times the uncertainty gives you. The best results. So, uh, result wise, uh, we surpassed all the um, state of the art on the established anomaly detection uh, data sets. And uh, also, we, um, we surpassed all the 
the benchmark zone so now where many hypothesis about the activities. Another discovery that is a um, um, find um, is uh, um, about uh, the combined distance and uncertainty. Here we can see the plots where we have the uncertainty on the ethnic axis, axis and the cosine distance on the y axis. So we can see that when we uh, add more uncertainty, there is also a larger error. So um, a larger error um, and uncertain, so we can rid of, uh, get rid of uh, the um, of the samples that are uncertain, and uh, in this case, we have uh, less uh, false positives. And yeah, let's see. Thank you very much for the talk. Does we have time now? Three minutes for any questions. Okay, so we still no more questions. Thanks to speaker again. So we continue with the second spotlight talk. Okay, so welcome our second speaker, uh, Lars Seger um, from MD Tech Software. Uh, we'll talk about exploring the importance of pre trained feature extractors for unsupervised novel detection and localization. Thank you, yours. Hello again, my name is Lars. Um, I'm happy to present to you our research, which my colleagues have created for the MMI. Explore the importance of different feature extractors for us to provide some detection in the organization. Probably all of you know the The website and the different benchmarks are available. Of course, this also case for anomaly detection. On the slide here, you can see the leaderboard for anomaly detection performance on the MMTech and the rest. However, I don't want to talk about leaderboard or any specific method in particular, but rather about a general observation. And looking at the possible filters below the leaderboard, describing how many different network architectures are used for the task of vision on linkage, which is from classic CNN architectures, aggressive vision transport. Oftentimes, these architectures are pre trained on certain pre text tasks like image net classification, and then they can be used for extracting features for non linkage. Observing this high variety of feature extractors across the research projects, we ask the following question. How important is the choice of feature extractor for unsupervised anomaly detection? To ask this question, we analyze different anomaly detection methods with respect to each space play operator. We conducted our experiments using the MDTEC AD case. From the input images, we extract the features using different pre trained feature extractors that are commonly used in the research community. An interesting figure delivers our study to using the features in the single layer of the extraction method. We then pass these features from the single layer to the respective anomaly detection model. Finally, the anomaly detection performance is evaluated given the result in anomaly maps. We analyze the asymmetric student teacher framework, class flow, and cash flow, which are, of course, all representatives of feature extraction based anomaly detection methods. 
So what happens if we marry the select feature inspector and layer and how does it affect the normal detection performance? On this slide here, some qualitative results are shown in the patch table. Each row in the figure shows the result of anomaly maps for a given effect in the sample or one of the four investigating inspectors. For each extractor, we considered four listed layers, which are represented in the respective pattern. As expected, the resulting anomaly maps did greatly depending on the choice of extractor and layer. For example, when that is a wide resistivity as feature extractor and the third layer according to our comprehender, the defect that occurs in the head of the screen can be recognized quite easily. In Congress, taking the second layer and the very same inspection network results in the very anomaly map where the defect is marked less salient. The importance of the select structure and layer is also to a good quantitative. For the three different investigative methods, you can see the anomaly detection performance in terms of initial investigation in the first and the corresponding localization quality in the second row. Here, we order the different layers within the extractor network by the relative resistance basis. However, I don't want to draw your attention to the absolute values and phase in the specific extractor of the layer, but rather to the general changes in the performance that occur. Just by varying the select feature expected layer, the only detection performance in terms of finished level classification varies by more than 10% of the standard. The corresponding localization quality even changes by more than 30% for each of the investigative methods. These results indicate that the feature extraction, that feature extraction based non detection methods are highly sensitive to the specific choice of feature extraction. So now that we have seen the importance of the online feature space for non detection performance, we will also ask which parameters might potentially influence the actual choice of the extractor in there. Our findings here can be summarized as follows. First, we could confirm that self supervised treatment strategies of the feature extraction network can lead to performances similar to the concept of supervised emission. Second, when analyzing the feature space, the image size is another important parameter to consider, since its influence on the anomaly detection performance cannot be neglected. And third, we found that the best performing layer within the inspector network heavily depends on the particular object category of the end data set. Thus, the specific application scenario is high impact and choice feature inspector in the game. When we observe the influence of all these parameters in the general impacts of an ongoing performance on the online feature space, we finally wanted to know what is possible by just using a single layer feature extraction. So we took a look at the following scenario. Given, given a certain value detection problem, what if we knew the best feature inspector in layer in advance? Compared to the baseline, where we try to reproduce the official results, taking the best of all investigative layers per object and per group results in comparable or even better classification performance across methods. Additionally, choosing an optimal image size for each extraction can probably improve the detection of us. Please note that the, these trends can also be observed for the, for the localization quality, which is not shown. So, but what do these results now mean for each extraction based on the detection? Well, let me remind you that some of the, that some state of the art methods like test flow, test flow, usually rely on sounding approaches for reaching the maximum performance. Such could be concatenating mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. features from multiple layers or using multiple feature extractors. In contrast, this experiment reveals that it is also possible to reach state of the art performance by using the features of a single, carefully chosen layer. In our opinion, this finding strongly motivates the research and development of object specific feature selection strategies or feature extraction based on the image. To conclude this presentation, let me briefly summarize our work. We performed the first systematic analysis of the dependence of non infection methods on different feature inspectors in the immediate range. Here, we showed that the investigative methods are highly sensitive to the specific choice of each inspector. And finally, we identified that an object specific feature selection strategy is a promising direction for future research in the field of unsupervised innovation. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to get some more questions and if you're interested in more detail, please come to our first Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
What do you think the foundation was? There's some recently like segment right thing or like dino or something. I do just be able to pull and make more together teacher age characters. So you're not going to step specific or category teacher age characters in the suggestion. So good question. Um I think my 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 job is the same problem is the bunch of information is very helpful for people to see and teach inspectors. So from a practical point of view, it might be more beneficial to still have an object specific teaching connection. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the uh, great presentation. My question is about the uh, pre training strategy that you mentioned. Uh, in our experiments, uh, we sometimes notice that um, when we set the pre training rates to false or true, uh, when we extract the features, we don't see any performance gains um, in the methods that you mentioned, like patch or or basketball. Of course, this doesn't always happen, but in, in many cases of empty categories, uh, we sometimes observe them. Uh, but like, can you elaborate the pre training strategy that you mentioned in um, in the presentation? Is it like something about this or uh, something different? No, it's uh, it's not really switching the single parameter, but it's more than. And like comparing different unsupervised pre training strategies like the local and you know, yeah, like local to the supervised interactive. So it's not just an object. Okay. Yeah, we haven't investigated that uh, in detail yet, but this is something we observed recently. I don't know if anyone in the room uh, observed as well, but uh, yeah, sometimes uh, pre training goes uh, in the head and but yeah, just one. Yeah. Yeah. So we did it for certain and basically some of the other things that we saw in five instances. Like the field benefits from the things that are like. I mean, just in the way. So the most famous approach, that's a good question. Um, so what we observed was yeah, the most famous approach would maybe be to use some, some simple um, defect like images and the delay forms of some features. And then you extract by picking picking features separately or you evaluate the performance of the of a specific layer. Based on synthetic defects, simple defects. See if this is if the layer can basically detect these simple defects and if not, it can not be considered. Um, so, so maybe to turn on to this, um, have you looked at kind of transferability estimation? Because that's kind of the task to um, tell how good it is to use a specific pre trained feature extractor for the downstream task by using only the, the data set. And that ideally we would have to do with uh, defect free images only. Was there anything investigated in this? Like as another avenue into this direction, or do you plan to do this? So we're currently working on yeah, an object specific uh, feature connection strategy, but we did not really investigate this further in this um, work. But yeah, you're completely right. Um, annually, you don't need any or any data for instance for selecting the feature. It would be to be yeah, so thank you very much for the talk. So thanks to speak again. All right, and we'll see you next time. It's going to be our second most solution package from Dr. Williams and Dr. Chen. He's from the Business System Professor at the Ethical University of the University of the And his most solution choice is currently the foundation of the second. And it remains on the layer of some of these elements. And they're quite in our field, like the Spain method or the MNAS. Thank you very much. Um, good morning.
Session of the workshop will be um, located at the uh, 247 uh, to 261. It's in the West Exhibition House, so you can either go outside or use kind of the underground connection to go there to the Exhibition Hall and check out the posters there. Then. Proceedings, maybe. Yeah, 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 maybe. Um, so there is a number for each for this and this So, our community has made huge progress um, over the last five years. Um, obviously, people have been working with a lot of decades, but I, I would say that maybe over the last couple of years, it really stopped working nicely for you guys. Um, I'm showing the same people's medical trials as everyone else has shown. Um, you can see how things have improved a lot. And I would say that the secret source would really be better representation learning, so supervised learning, and using stronger foundation models. I guess the challenges of this progress is that many of our popular benchmarks are really saturated, not perfectly saturated, but we're getting those studies. So the problem is, though, that the number of questions is by no means so. So we really need to find what's the next challenge, what's next. So the agenda for this talk consists of four parts. 
it was always some foundation models, which I think somewhat overlaps with the previous tool, but it has to be less. Um, a negative result, a note will launch in a normal infection. Um, paying for lunch with some plus friends, basically getting around to still be lunch, and a grand challenge. Okay, so let's begin with the first part, the promise of the foundation model. So normal infection is really the task of discovering grand, but interesting phenomena. And these show different objectives to quantity. Oh, <laughs> So, uh, just to put this out, so anomaly detection is really the task of discovering the rare but the interesting phenomena. And both these objectives are important. We can't just have one. So, classical methods really concentrated on finding rare phenomena, where rare means no lighting. Now, this really is a problem in statistics, estimating the probability density of data. I mean, this is obviously very challenging, but this is one specific aspect of the problem. And basically, once we estimated this probabilistic model, then no likely samples under our model could be designated as an object. Well, this two dimensional data set, this is not too challenging. Sure. So, classical non detection methods have actually performed really well on no dimensional data. They, they work well. We didn't really need deep down into that sort of thing. The problem is that once we hit high dimensional data, this is no longer really true, like images, for example. Right? And there's two real challenges. The first one is that density estimation um, from low sample sizes is actually a really challenging problem. It's this is in some cases with no assumption, you know, that there's fundamental limits. And the second issue is once we have high dimensionality, then we have many degrees of variation that we don't actually care about. They're not actually very interesting. Right? For example, if we consider an image with one bird pixel. So this is quite a normal idea with the image. This under a statistical model, this would be anonymous, but this is not an interesting one. This is not the thing that we would like to find. Right? It's not a snipe. Okay, and that's sort of where the phenomenal detection comes in. We basically want to use these networks as semantic encoders, which map samples to representation. Now, obviously that by itself isn't interesting, but we want these representations to satisfy some interesting problems. For example, we want the normal data to lie in compact spaces, we want them to be low dimensional, we want the representation to keep the semantic degrees of variation and throw away the uses. These are the things that we wish to have, but obviously it's very challenging to do so. Okay, and, and so one of the main approaches that this is being tackled is using self supervised and many excellent approaches tackling that. I just mentioned three lines of work, but there's been many. If I'm going to again, it's not due to lack of importance, but just due to lack of time. So the first line of works is autoencoders, which have already been presented before then. There is that we take um, each sample, we map it to a low-dimensional representation, then we try to reconstruct the original sample. Because we train autoencoders in normal data, we assume that for test type normal data will be quite successful, but because anomalous data are presumed to come from different distribution, then it will be O and D, and we might um not generalized well. And so using the reconstruction error, we can use that as an anomaly score to differentiate between normal and anomalous um, samples. So some uh, two methods that um, use this kind of obviously being many are DNGML by Zongital and DFSVDD by Rockital could be used that as a retraining strategy. Another line of works is predicting your 
that's the next. Right, well, basically, we have to pick up the same stage where we transform the feed with it and we sell the speech image in a random location. I don't need to take this image, and this helps us create a big supervised data set consisting of rotated image and rotation output tests. Now we can train the supervised classifier on that. This is the project idea by the direct but it's been adapted to anomaly detection um, by basically using the prediction accuracy in order to uh, add some sort of anomaly score. And again, the idea is that we're not going to generalize well out of distribution. And so using full generalization as a way of, uh, as an anomaly score. And a couple of examples of work in this case include the seminal work by Roland and me, and the work by Henry uh, And we've actually done some work in this space. So, where the idea was to extend this to general data by replacing rotations, which are very image specific, to um, random affine transformation, which applies more general distribution. And the, the final line of supervised works that I want to um, mention is contrastive learning. And contrastive learning is a well-known um, self-supervised representation learning paradigm, um, but basically it's been extended to anomaly detection by um, including negative augmentations, which is really a way of merging it with rotation prediction. And anomaly scoring now compares using density estimation, which is there is also other strategy. And certain examples works in CSI by Capital and John Benson. Okay, so self-supervised learning has obviously made mass progress in a long description, but there are actually challenges in, in applying it in, in many cases because self-supervised learning actually needs large data sets. Um, whereas often in the long detection, at least in our academic benchmarks, we have reasonably small training sets because they have to be normal data, getting normal data, which we're sure about is not always trivial. And um, also the variation in our data sets can usually be reasonably limited, which limits the quality of the distribution. So one potential idea is to use foundation models with the train on large external data sets and use them to extract potentially more powerful representation. And it's, they're readily available on the shelf, so there's no issue with supervision because you can just download it. Really. It's easy enough. Um, some examples of these foundation models include clip. Image and the potential <coughs> So we performed um, a simple experiment called deep nearest neighbors um, by Mexicans um, in And the, the idea was that we use some, well, the former generation of foundation models, right, the rest of the training image, to extract representations from the entire data, both training and next. And now we use the k nearest neighbor distance in the representation space, which means that for every test image, we compute its distance for every train image in the representation space. Then we pick the k images which are nearest to it, we usually pick k equals one or two. And this is used as our anomaly scheme. So this is obviously a very simple strategy, and it's not really needed for the k nearest neighbors. It has been around the anomaly detection, probably as long as there has been anomaly. And, but the, the thing that was encouraging is that this, at the time, achieved um, slightly better results than the state of the art, um, which seemed encouraging. This is just it. Now, one. Well, as the distribution on which this foundation model was trained. And this is a fairly small foundation, right? This is only trained in But um, luckily, we found the generalized model on many data sets, um, including well, here we're just trying to find some of these uh, private images for these data sets. And you can see some industrial images, some aerial images, some specific images, so things that are not too similar to the image. Okay, but this is only um, maybe a fairly basic idea because at the end of the day, it seems pretty wasteful just to have these pre trained uh, foundation model representation and not exploit in any way the fact that we actually have a training set of global data, right? We should really adapt to our training distribution. And so, um, the simple idea in Panda was to fine tune those foundation model representations on the mobile data using some self supervised object. Now, there are many self-supervised objectives, and we've actually tried quite a few of them, and each one of them makes a little bit of So let's say that our baseline 
uh, of the engine is very two point five, and we wanted to improve that. So the basic idea in Canada was to get this virus loss from um, from the SDD by lockdown, and to use that to try to create a new game distribution. Um, so this actually needed a trick to get it to work. We need to stop it. Um, I don't want to collapse it. And this reached about very good speed to work with this. Then um, we tried combining with having um, a foundation model of applications with the contrasted loss. And this actually needed more. This needed something more than um, the mean shifting, basically using the bridge mean. Um, and this needed another one the same. Right? And then finally, by adapting dynamo um, and, and using the same loss by tuning on the training of on our normal training set, um, without actually any tricks to mean anything. This already reached 98.4. It's not exactly fair because Dino uses the larger model than this one, but it's showing the trend, right? You know, we, can, we can use this strategy to get reasonably nice, nearly central. Nearly central. <laughs> now, another generalization of this approach, which is already mentioned in, in the previous talk, um, was to extend the same ideas to a normal simulation. So now we use those foundation models to extract deep presentations. Um, there, but dense representations for every image region. And then we do exactly the same, right? We run dense estimation against all the image regions of the training set. And that was enough to, um, to achieve stable down performance at the time. It's already been improved significantly by other things. Specifically, I would like to mention Patchpool by uh, Robert uh, who works significantly. These results are um, using a similar strategy, but significantly. Um, but, but they are really important at very risk. So they're really, really sexual. Okay, so so far in this part, we've shown that um, so if we utilize foundation model organizations, we, we can achieve really nice performance, nearly saturated with some of everything. Um, so it may appear as if if we keep extending this idea, basically just scaling up our foundation models, we can solve an image. But I would like to argue that this isn't actually the case um, because of fundamental limits. And here I'm showing how, for example, natural language processing, they keep scaling up their models, or their models, and results really do keep getting there. But I would like to argue that anomaly detection is actually. Okay, so let's consider an example anomalous plug in our training set, we see many images of birds. And there's a lot of variation in the normal set, uh, different species, different backgrounds, different wavelengths, different colors, and so on. Now, at test time, we see a combination of both normal birds, the same, pretty much the same distribution as the training set, and also images of anomalous birds, which differ from the normal set by just having very long weeks. Right? So, this is the differentiating action. So, can we use the foundation methods? Um, to detect these anomalies. Okay, so let's assume that we have perfect foundation models and we can get them to do exactly what we want. What is the optimal representation that we would want this foundation model to learn? So let's think about this. The representation has to be sufficient. By sufficient, I mean that it has to include the differentiating attribute between normal and anomalous state. So it has to have the attribute of the big one, right? Otherwise, we will not be able to explain it between normal and anomalous. The problem is that we don't know in advance which is the anomalous attribute. And so really to be on the safe side, we have to include all that. So we have to have a perfectly informed, a expressive representation, including all attributes. Now, this is somewhat problematic. And the problem is that as we increase expressiveness, our detector becomes less and less sensitive. Why? Because the more attributes that we have, as long as we have noises, as long as we have some variation in each one of these modes, the actual anomalous attribute is being moved by the vast number of all the other irrelevant pieces. Right? Now, this is only a heuristic argument um, in, in the paper by um, Carlos and Nifkoy. Uh, I and mean, we actually have a, a more um, precise mathematical um, argument 
And uh, this is done for a fairly toy setting, obviously using um, the Gaussian assumption. So this is um, some of the toy model, but it does actually um, show that the sensitivity of the model where sensitivity is like equals between the two a positive rate and the false positive rate scales as one over the square root of the number of attributes. So as we increase the number of attributes to be on the safe side, to make sure that we include the attributes that we care about, it, the more we increase the sensitivity of our game. So there is some sort of trade-off, and this trade-off is highly non trivial So this leads us to formulating a low-free lunch for an only detection. And the idea is that the successful anomaly detection algorithm must choose the smallest number of attributes, which include the unspecified anomalous attribute. So this is quite problematic because we don't know this attribute in advance. And so the informal um, result of this is that there is no one foundation model of representation that fits everything because we want the representation to be minimal, but we want it to be sufficient for our tasks. So this has to be possible. Okay, um, so this principle is actually somewhat discouraged, right? Because it means that we, we don't have this kind of just you know, extending deep learning and at some point it's going to be slow again. Um, but there is actually a way of learning. Um, and so we call it paying for our lunch using strong files. So the idea is that in order to make sure we actually include the actual we care about, we need to have some sort of priors on where to look at these numbers, what sort of attributes they then look at, right? This is the prior that we need. And on the other hand, we also need to select priors that are easy to computationally work because there's some things that we can specify perhaps in different language, but we find it quite difficult to find these representations. So I don't actually have a recipe for making this work, but I'll show three different works that go along this way. And I think that it should be quite easy to generalize from this many tasks. So the first task that I'm going to mention is point out the normal detection. The idea is that as input, we receive a point out, which is basically a set of um, points. Each one of them includes the location information, X, Y, Z, and also the colors, RGB, right? And we have a set of these. This occurs quite often when we have light on other geometric. Now, we can specify uh, a few points that um, occur at least in, in industrial science. The first one is that anomalies lie in way of well known glass regions. This is also um, often the case in a and also in images, not just in contacts. The second one here, uh, the importance is that it, the anomalies can occur both in color and in geometry. And the third one is that anomalies should be key point invariant because it really doesn't matter for which way we look, this should still be anomalous. So, our solution was basically to develop a representation which includes these three points. So, to make sure we can detect um, image color anomalies, we just use the, the same representation as the one used in touch ball. Um, but to make sure we can detect geometric, um, anomalies, we use the classical, very powerful classical point out feature, uh, which is viewpoint invariant for the FDA. Right? This is nothing new, this um, is already known. Yes. And basically, by having a representation which combines both these um, types of attributes and then doing that the estimation using K given status, plus, um, we were able to achieve state of the performance on the and the MBTEC 3D things by the MBTEC team by government. And so this work is by um, Eliyahu Hobbits, who will be presented in the session. So if you're interested, please make sure to visit the poster. And I should say that um, although I think this method is still state of the art in terms of open parable and state of the art in terms of segmentation quality, I think it's just been outperformed at the image level by one we done while presenting in the main conference. So please make sure to check out the work. Okay, um, another interesting setting that we wanted to tackle was um, video anomalies. Um, so in, in security videos, there are a couple of bias, a, a couple of anomalies that often occur, at least in academic data sets, but obviously in real life settings. And that's anomalies in object speed, in object time, so objects that we uh, do not expect, and in human pose, 
And you may say, what about unusual activities? So unusual activities are usually expressed by unusual funds. So our solution is actually quite straightforward. Given this file, we just come up with um, representations that agree with these types of behaviors that we need. So anomalies in object speed can be expressed using the optical flow. Um, so we just take a deep optical flow extractor and use the, that. And um, the anomalies in human pose, the off the shelf human pose extractor, we just use the pose for that. And object type is well characterized by these features, such as um, the clip image encoder or various other types of images. So just by combining these three representations, combining that with standard density estimation techniques, such as taking your statements for more high-dimensional data, and then GMMs for the lower dimensional data, and this was sufficient for achieving state-of-the-art performance on the popular um, video log detection data sets, PET2, I think we right there. Um, so this one is by my student uh, Dalmas. Okay, and the final setting that I wanted to mention um, is logical anomaly detection. The challenge here is to detect unusual combinations of normal elements. This task has been well formulated by the Emmett team, by paper by Belton. And I actually wanted to take this opportunity to thank the Emmett team for producing all these wonderful data sets, which I know have really um, enhanced our risk. So thank you. Um, so, specifically here in logical anomaly detection, um, I, I'm just mentioning one specific example because it might be easier to understand what we mean by this task. Um, so the normal, normal images in this task are when we have one long, one long screw, one short screw, two nuts, um, sorry, two, bowl, two washers, and two nuts. Thank you. I'm not sure about the next image. Um, now, structural anomalies are when and basically, we have some local element which is anomalous, and we don't have to look at the rest of the image in order to see that it is anomalous, like the epidemics, the standard. So, here, for example, we can see that the short screw has a weird addition, and this weird addition doesn't happen for any normal image. So, just by looking at this weird addition, we know that this element is anomalous, regardless of the rest of the image. Differently, in logical anomaly action, each element of the image is perfectly known. The specific anomaly here is that we have long screws, as opposed to one long and one short screw. Now, each element is fine. Long screws are fine. We have long screws in all of them, but we don't expect to have two. So these local approaches can't be expected to get this right, right? Because each local element is fine. So we need to look at the distribution. So this leads us to the prior of this, which is that the specific ordering or location or um, the values of specific elements below right? too much. What we want is to model the distribution of elements. We want to see if the distribution of elements is off. And so the way that um, Nipko and um, my student uh, attack this problem is by having a set representation of elements. So each one of these elements is now, um, we describe it using big features, so basically path representations, the same as we've done in patch core and similar approaches, state uh, and similar approaches. But the, um, the different thing here is that um, we want a set representation describing the distribution of these elements. The way that we do it is that we inject each element to a single dimension, basically it becomes a scale at this point. And now we um, summarize the as uh, distribution across the image by just having a histogram of these scale elements. Now, because these random projections are fairly arbitrary, we perform quite a lot of them, basically fully described distributions. We have 500 different projections, which lead to 500 different histograms per image. We concatenate these histograms, and this gives us the image representation. Now that we have this image representation, we can perform density estimation with these states. The important thing is that um, this representation is invariant to the order of the elements. And I should also mention that it's related to the slide passage time distance, but I, I won't allude to it beyond this. Um, so this approach was sufficient for achieving state of the results on the end of global data sets, but I should mention that it has complementary strengths with GCAT by um, um, by the because um, this approach is 
increasingly insensitive to the spatial location, and there are some that there are some anomaly classes that actually do care about the spatial location. So these are the complementary strength. We we have to the spatial location to some extent, but not to extent. And so I, I think a combination of the two approaches might be a great uh, future line. Okay. So, so far, I haven't given a precise recipe for how to come up with these priors. But so as long as you, have, you can come up with class specific priors, then you can see a general paradigm of how to use them, combine them with representation learning methods in order to um, keep strong and all information. So, this leads us to the last part, the grand challenge for all detection. So, as we've seen, current anomaly detection methods have really made great progress in industrial inspection, in security. And the important thing about these tasks is that we know them very well. And so we can think of all the very good clients about their anomalies. And so, right, we, we, because we understand our data. And so, in this case, we've actually achieved significant growth. The problem is how do we have the task which we have no idea what the anomalies actually look like? And I wanted to bring one particular one, an important task like this, which is scientific discovery. Now, anomaly detection is key to discovery. And this has been well known in the philosophy of science. And um, Thomas Kuhn is a, a very prominent philosopher of science in his magnum opus, The Structure of the Scientific Revolution, and um, claims that discovery begins with the awareness of an um, anomaly. And because of this anomaly, um, it is some paradigm shift in science. We have to fit to have a new theory that actually fits with this anomaly, but this anomaly actually fits. And once um, there's this paradigm shift, then the scientist sees the world in a different way. Now, this is somewhat abstract. So I want to give one concrete example of an actual discovery that was I've done using something which is human anomaly infection, anomaly infection. So let's consider the discovery of penicillin, right? So this is something quite important. And um, Alexander Fleming came back to the kitchen and he inspected the collection of petri dishes that he put uh, before the pot. And as expected, he found that they had bacteria in them. But the thing that wasn't expected is that he noticed that areas that had more than them did not have bacteria. So this was strange. This was anomalous. And so by inspecting this further, he came up in the discovery of penicillin, which is one of the four studies in modern days. So obviously we haven't discovered anything quite as important as penicillin yet, um, but we have tried um, basically substantiating this a little bit more and um, making baby steps in this direction. So we tried using a non infection for novel protein detection. Um, the way we constructed the data set is by um, we, as a we train, we have a set of human things. Then at this time, we have a mixture between human and virus. And so luckily for proteins, there are actually um, foundation models. So we used one foundation model for protein representation. We did not use alpha four because it's actually very difficult to use. So we used ESM, which is a kind of language model by our basic research, which is much easier to use. It's much more similar to the things that we used to. And then um, we perform density estimation in the same way that we did it before. And we, we found that the virus proteins were detected at 98.7% um, roughly. See, now we tried some other attributes which were discovered with slightly lower attributes. It's not everything, 99%. Um, but it seems that this approach um, has some, some problems. Um, so this work is by um, Sears and Colonel and in and by my esteemed collaborator, um, Michael Lillian. So it may seem um, from this previous slide as if scientific discovery is now going to be easy for anomaly detection, and this is by no means the case. There are many challenges in scientific anomaly detection, and I believe that current approaches are insufficient. The question that we would need to answer are, what are the right representations? What are the good prize for scientific discovery? Because the important thing about scientific discovery is that we don't know what to expect. If we knew what to expect, this would not really be a discovery. Um, how to incorporate the current scientific paradigm into the anomaly detection algorithms? As we said, Bloom's theory is very much about having an existing paradigm and the anomaly beginning. How do we incorporate this paradigm into our method? 
scientific nomenclature is unseen for us. We do not know what is known. But I'm typically in our class, we do not work in the unsupervised setting, although there have been many good works in the unsupervised. And finally, scientific nomenclature is more remote. This is not just about imaging. They have so many different sets of answers to be so, as um, maybe a small step is towards this direction, um, I'm just going to start a significantly less run, but still a very challenging question, which is what is the most anonymous image in the image? Right now, this is a deceptively easy question. What do you mean? You evaluate a lot of our tests on image. But really, if you're given the image methods without further guidance, What's the most anonymous image in this data set? This is a reasonably challenging task, right? There are some common issues with scientific anomaly detection. This, this is really a discovery This is fully unsupervised, right? We just have the image that we set, you know, what's normal and what's not. And a very unclear priors. In what sense do we mean that this is anonymous? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. No very easy answers. Um, this is still simpler than scientific anomaly detection for several reasons. One is images, we've done a lot of work with this. And the second is that this data set is unimodal, which is also simpler. And the third, we have very powerful foundation for image, but still, this is a very challenging. Um, so, overall, I would say that this grand, in this grand challenge, the rewards can be great because it, it could really make an orientation a key tool for the whole of science. I'm extending beyond uh, the specific industrial tasks that are our main applications at the moment. Um, now, I'll, I'll have an archive version of, games of, of some of these ideas um, quite soon. Um, they're not up yet. Um, I would like to thank the students who have actually done this work. Um, so, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Neil Cohen, who's currently looking for a first up, and he's been talking about 75% of all of these works. And it's really good. So if you need recommendations, um, I'm very, very happy to find them. Um, and I think any lab would be lucky to have. Um, and I would also like to thank Carl Rice, Yvonne Bergman, Eliel Hobbits, and Isan Zahra. So just to summarize, the presentation from the foundation models have led to large gains in a non infection, but there are fundamental limits to this paradigm. Now, Prize can actually help make further gains, and they might even be required to make these further gains. But such prize are available, and they're also available in many industrial tasks. So it's not that this is focused, they are actually available. But the grand challenge is the type of tasks for which these prizes are non obvious, and I specifically highlighted scientific discovery as such important task. So it's been an exciting five years in the non detection, and I believe the future will be. Even more. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to interact in terms of questions in any way. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that was a very nice talk. I'm not sure about the questions. Maybe we can have uh, one question and then we have to show the conversation, but I think we'll do a round at the conference. And maybe we can also ask some questions to my hand directly to you. Is there a question? Yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk and, and for the clarity and explanation. So I um I have a I have a doubt regarding the Kenya's neighbor. So we learned uh, um theoretically it is a good uh, um classifier. So, so if you do that in a good feature space. Uh, but I'm, I'm worried about the scalability of this, right? You can't do image and recognition according to KNN, and I wonder to which uh, extent is it can actually keep doing anomaly detection with KNN. So, no, um, so that, that's a great question, and it's uh, obviously something that um, research is trying to tackle, because uh, as you said, KNN um, scales linearly with the amount of um, training data that we have, and for large data sets, this is slow. In memory. Um, so it has been, so uh, now working in other works like uh, practical, and um, this has been controlled by uh, clustering or other types of 
data compression and methods, which look very similar to the type of the models in performance. So if you care about performance, there are various ways of seeing there's also very spectral hacking method. And seeing that DNA is probably one of the most well studied um, problems in computer science. Um, and so if you need to speed up DNA, um, you can use savings. Um, but if you want to use you know, some more sophisticated techniques, there's a past literature on that. Um, so this can be sped up. But um, thank you very much for this question. I mean, if, if I should make this. Thank you. thank you so much. Yeah, so thank you once more for your So to not have down or uh, contemplate to back in your uh, valuable time for post session, we decided to extend the uh, post session and coffee break by 10 minutes. So we'll meet again here at 5 past uh, 11. We'll see you back. What are the post numbers? I speak in my voice so that very the more so and I don't know how to speak so I can even which I can even if you want to get you to put it to the one and so on so and then I can see this one I'll say you this my friends. Yeah, I'll say you Yeah, it's been warning, didn't it? Yeah. Good question. Or a white press. You know, 30 people are right. <laughs> 30 people are right. So, what, 30 plus here? Yeah. So, you.
Then when I plug it in here to the heavyweight track, I do actually see something moving there. Testing, testing, oh, testing. Yeah. So it is coming in. Yeah. But it, it doesn't, oh, it, it is coming from here. Yeah, you can see. It's coming yeah. from here. It is coming in. Yeah, it's coming in. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that might be a solution. So it's definitely not there. Oh, so, hmm? Okay. So. So that beats me trying to then. My only other option, because I haven't got a jack to go to there, was to find there's a USB port on that. Wait, that looks bad. Can you see it also? Yeah. I, I can also, I'm logged into the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you stopped doing that, Hubert. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I see something there, but I'm not sure whether it's picked up by that one or if it's directly coming from that one. So, <coughs> you guys speak, I'll go out of the room so I can hear the Zoom. Okay, this is, this uh, is yeah, actually Zoom. That'll be a good idea. So, totally I'm, so, I'm logging into Zoom from my phone. Yeah. So I'm test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right there. All right, testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Testing. Yep. So the interesting thing is that you have that signal in your system, but soon the system is now connected to the It was. Can you press that? Okay. It's fine, Jack. I'm going to. I think it's perfect. Testing one, two, three, 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 one, two, three,
Who is here? Who's on? No, that was a misclick. <clears throat> Testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing, testing. Hello, hello. 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 Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine.
Are you still muted? Sorry? Are you still muted now? Or? No, no, she's okay. going up. So um, let me just check that I've got everything right. Speak her off. Okay. It seems to work now. Does the sound fine now? Sound okay. fine now. Do you have an echo or is it working properly? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Eight. I think it's about as good as it's going to get. I don't think it's, yeah. I don't think it's right. Yeah. We had a very similar problem at the FTC last year and did our audio technician at the end to get us procedural out of here. Yeah, he had a first vision of time works, but even then with that person left, we should know this quicker. It wasn't perfect. So yeah. crazy. So but it was better than this. So but yeah, maybe we can feed that back. But uh,
the Are you happy? Yeah, yeah, I have it on me. What is the next one you said, right? The next one. Uh, uh, As in the. Push like that. And then there's something there. Telling. One second, I'll just take a few days. Yes, I need to stop for When they invite the speakers, yeah. Yeah, he went over along, right? He went like 15 minutes, or were you, were you guys running behind? We were running behind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like they had it. And it's, it's not optimal to kind of get those stations to get out of your fingers. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the coffee. Yeah, oh, is there a good, good coffee? coffee? Oh, there is coffee. The thing is that I'm asking why she made no. that really to kind of pick that the audio. No, there's not. There's <laughs> not coffee. Well, you have to pay. There's just water. Still You don't have to. Yeah, I um, emailed them. They're mostly doing uh, running industry because they're doing uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, you're talking about the stuff in those people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the challenge is like somebody put the wrong thing in there. Yeah. On Slack. Uh, yeah, you're right. Please. Slack. 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 No, 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 it's a challenge. The bar off is one of the yeah. 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 Ah, okay, sorry. Two of them are in person, two of them are virtual. Uh, oh, yeah, two of them are virtual. Yeah, a lot of uh, like So we need to also be prepared for that. Where are you going to kind of the same Yeah. I have to wonder. It's only 10 months. I have no understanding of it. I'm just trying to understand how it's supposed to work. In like, how it's supposed to work. That line, that must be something that's supposed to.
Are there few short uh, challenge winners here? Few short challenge winners. Yeah. 
Okay, so welcome back everyone. Uh, I guess a few people more will come in, but uh, we start so we do not have any more delay. Um, so we have uh, the third uh, invited talk given by uh, um, Dr. Chi Ren. Uh, she's a senior uh, scientist at uh, Google DeepMind and um, she did her PhD in computational biology and bioinformatics in uh, MC in statistics at the University of South uh, Carolina, California. And um, her research interests are developing robust and reliable methods for biomedical data analysis and with focus on uncertainty, quantification, and out of distribution detection in deep learning. So I think it kind of complements the series of talks that we had today quite nicely. Yeah, so the stage is yours. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be here today um, sharing some of our work, recent progress on early detection and uncertainty isolation using text image formation models. Um, I really want to give my special thanks to the workshop organizer. And there's a very good opportunity for us to meet in person and uh, um, share our ideas on the next line of research. Um, I'm a research scientist at Google uh, Brain. Uh, now it's Google DeepMind, part of Google DeepMind. Um, in today's talk, I will uh, go over um, some uh, perspectives of how to use um, Click style uh, text image foundation models to do all the detection and uncertainty estimation. Uh, in the previous two uh, invited talks, I think uh, those are very good um, talks. They lay very good foundations. Um, so I will directly go to the topic to talk about what we have done on the all detection and uncertainty estimation for uh, using the uh, text image model. So we have um, in this uh, area, um, our question is how do we adapt uncertainty and uh, robustness literature to this image text setting? This is a new type of model with multi-model inputs. Definitely there are new challenges. For example, uh, those foundation models are very big. So the model size is large. Traditional method like ensemble uh, is no longer feasible because we are not, uh, it's too expensive to do multiple models on someone. So how do we effectively infer the uncertainty? Um, it's a key question here. Um, but on the other hand, definitely it, it brings more opportunities. For example, uh, since this text input can be incorporated into the prediction, it helps us to get a better old detection using uh, outlier exposure. Uh, so in this line of research, um, I will talk about our work on OD detection and also our work on uncertainty estimation. Um, yeah, I still want to emphasize why do we care about OD detection? Because in an ideal world, we assume the in distribution, sorry, assume the training distribution and the test distribution follow the same distribution. However, it's never the case for the real world the test distribution uh, is not the same as the training distribution. And we can see a lot of uh, like different kind of shifts in the test data. One very common shift is called the covariance shift. Um, this is the shift on the feature space, the X space. Uh, sometimes the image can be corrupted or some uh, noisy uh, uh, images can be, um, can came into the prediction model. And uh, this is um, something we see very common in self-driving cars. Um, the other type of shift is uh, in the label space. Um, here we call it open set recognition or anomaly detection. 
So this is one figure from uh, Sharon Lee's team. Uh, suppose we have a classifier for three class of dog, cat, and fish. But at that time, we see some birds showing up. This bird does not belong to any of the training classes. So this is something new, and we need to have all the detector to detect those new species. Uh, since I'm interested in the, uh, all the detection and applications in biomedical uh, applications, so here I want to give you some uh, motivation why we care about all detection in medical and biological fields. Uh, suppose we want to build a, a image classifier for uh, classifying the skin conditions. We can collect a lot of data for those common conditions like eczema or acne, because this, those are common conditions, so we can collect a lot of data for those classes. And then we can train a classifier for classification. However, when we deploy this model to real uh, scenario, we can uh, see a lot of rare conditions showing up. Those rare conditions, they are individually rare, but due to the long tail uh, distribution, they are collectively pretty rich. They can take up to 20% of the test data. So now we do need a old detector to help the model to understand there are some unseen conditions showing up and we shouldn't predict those unseen conditions into uh, the training classes. Another example is this uh, classification of bacteria species. Bacteria classification is very important <coughs> for infectious diseases. Uh, so the problem with this is that uh, we can train a classifier for different bacteria species, but only for those known bacteria species. In the real world, there are a lot of unknown species, uh, and the, our human knowledge is very limited about that. Uh, so this actually is the gene. It shows that um, as years go up, uh, we actually uh, discover more and more new species over the years, and it haven't been saturated yet. So when we de deploy our classifier, train a known species to the real world, the model really need to understand there are some unknown species in the real data and uh, we shouldn't predict any of those unknown into the known classes. So all the detector is uh, very important and how do we evaluate the performance of all the detector? Um, we uh, commonly have, once we have an old detector, uh, it will assign all the score for each of the test inputs. And we expect to see that the OD inputs will have a higher OD score than indomain inputs. And to quantitatively measure this, we can use AURC as a metric. If the AURC is one, then it indicates this uh, OD detector can perfectly detect the indomain from out of the what criteria do we consider when we're building an OD detector? Uh, I often consider from the two perspectives. Uh, one is data, the other is method. Uh, for data, uh, do we really have all the data available for training? If so, we should make use of it. Uh, it's very important to use the OD data to help us to get better decision boundary between in and out. Uh, on the other hand, do we have data for pre-training? If so, uh, we should uh, do the pre-training to help the model to get better representation. Uh, on the other hand, methods, uh, we can characterize the method into supervised or unsupervised, uh, depending on whether we want to use the label information or not. For the unsupervised method, uh, we can uh, think of this as uh, we fit a distribution for the training data. And then at the test time, we evaluate the test inputs under the fit distribution and see how uh, how low is the likelihood score. If the likelihood score is low, it indicates all. For supervised method, uh, those refers mostly to the classifier based method. So people consider using a softmax probability score or logic based score, or uh, like what uh, Professor Sharon Lee sh shared previously using the energy uh, score to build an uh, old detector. Uh, despite those considerations when we build the OD detector, I here want to share some challenges, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, very uh, uh, they are shared among all the methods. The first challenge is this long tail distribution problem. So 
even if we have all the data for treating all the detector, because of this long tail distribution, we can never ex uh, exhaust all possible all the uh, categories. So a model trained on a subset of all the may not be able to generalize well on the uh, on seeing all the categories. Another challenge is this uh, semantic similarities between in and out categories. We characterize we can characterize all the detection problem into far OD and near OD. For far OD, uh, in domain, out of domain uh, classes, they are very different, like CFAR versus SVHN. Sometimes those uh, simple methods can be very effective for detecting uh, far OD. But for near OD, uh, one example can be CFAR 100 versus CFAR 10. Those are uh, in total 110 classes, uh, independent classes. So uh, for this near OD problem, it's more challenging because sometimes the OD class can be semantically very similar to the in-domain class. For example, a uh, pickup truck in the OD domain versus the truck in the in-domain. Another case can be uh, the OD classes can share similar background with the in-domain class. For example, the fish and the airplane, they both share blue backgrounds. So the model really need to understand how to distinguish background from semantics in order to make the OD detection correct. So in the next few slides, I will talk about our effort on how to build up an OD detector, zero-shot OD detector using lead model. We use this uh, CIFAR 100, CIFAR 10 as a way to uh, study this near OD uh, problem. So uh, for a long time, people have tried different methods on this CIFAR 100, CIFAR 10 benchmark. And it, uh, only 85% uh, only AULC was achieved at maximum for this problem. So at that moment, we were wondering uh, whether this is because the problem is truly challenging or is it just um, the model cannot do well, but human can do it well. So we conducted a human evaluation and we see the human performance is actually 95%. Then we were sure, okay, so it's some, the model should have some room to improve. And we noticed at the moment, at the moment, we have noticed this vision transformer, which is a very powerful pre training and fine tuning model. It's pre trained on image 21K, 21,000 classes, and then fine tuned on some downstream tasks. It achieved a very good performance on CFAR and uh, the image uh, tasks. So at that moment, we were wondering. Uh, how was the performance of this model on our CIFAR 100, CIFAR 10 year old task? It turned out that it achieved very good performance, like 95%, almost as high as human performance. This ensures that this, uh, the, our hypothesis that the pre treating really helps a lot to help the model to understand the, the feature space and the, learn the rich and robust features. From there, we ask an uh, actual question. Can we avoid the fine tuning and build a zero shot OD, class, uh, OD detector? Because for this model, we still need to fine tune on downstream <coughs> class. The pre, uh, the pre trained model has a classification head of 21,000 classes. In order to use it, we need to do fine tuning. So the next question would be, uh, can we avoid fine tuning and build a zero shot OD detector? Then we notice this uh, very powerful uh, clip style uh, text image models. Um, so briefly introduce, uh, let me introduce this model. So the model is pre-trained on uh, text, uh, image capturing data. So the image and its uh, text, paired text, uh, encoded through image encoder and text encoder into the embedding space. And then the paired embeddings are encouraged to be closer in the embedding space than uh, a random pair. This is pre training stage. And then at the test time stage, we have the test image uh, fit into the image encoder. And then we have the class names fit into the text encoder. And we compare the image embedding with the class name embedding using cosine similarity 
as the logics, and the predicted class will be the class that has the highest similarity with the image. This is a very powerful new thought uh, classifier. As you can see here, uh, it's achieved this zero shot classifier achieved the same <laughs> performance as the previously ResNet 101 model on ImageNet. And it has significantly much better performance on other distributional shifting data, like ImageNet V2, ImageNet R, and so on. So we wondered whether this powerful clip model can be used for zero shot OD detection. Because it has some very good properties that could be helpful for all the detection. For example, it's pre-trained on large data, so the model learns rich and robust features. And the data can be very diverse, which implicitly can follow a long tail distribution. So this may be able to help us to generalize well to the long tail categories. Another perspective is this uh, hex image multimodal models provide an opportunity for us to incorporate all the class names into the OD detector without using any accompanying images. So uh, let me explain this in a minute. So based on that intuition, we build a zero-shot outlier exposure OD detector using click. The idea is uh, very simple. So suppose we have a test image here. We fed it into the image encoder get the image embedding. And now for the cluster part, we collect the in-domain labels as well as the OD labels and merge them into the label list. We project those labels into the embedding space and compute the Poisson similarity between the image and the text. Then we pass it to a softmax function to get the probability score. We use the sum of the probability score over the OD labels as our OD score. So our method is zero shot because we don't fine tune click. And our method is weak outlier exposure. We call it weak outlier exposure because we only use the names of the OD class without using any OD images. And surprisingly, we see using this simple method, we get 94, almost 95%. Uh, AURC for this challenging uh, CIFAR 100, CIFAR 10 benchmark. This is uh, almost the same <laughs> performance as previously uh, pre trained and fine tuned, fine tuned, uh, pre trained and fine tuned VIT model. So, this is very encouraging. Next, uh, we want to explore uh, whether this zero shot uh, classifier can be very helpful for more challenging benchmarks. For example, previously we were only testing this uh, zero shot classifier, uh, zero shot O detector on CIFAR dataset, which is a small scale dataset. So now we are exploring more large scale dataset. Also, previously we were testing on CIFAR 100 versus CIFAR 10. There we actually assumed the OD classes is only the 10 classes in the CIFAR 10 dataset. So it assumed a closed set OD detection problem. Now we are moving to a more challenging open set one class or detection problem. Um, this is, uh, in my opinion, this is more uh, realistic because in real practice, people often assume this all the classes, uh, sorry, in domain classes uh, consist of um, classes belonging to a super class and all the uh, anything that is not in the super class. Let me give you an example. Uh, we want to train, for example, we want to train a person classification model to localize the people in the images. Uh, there, uh, if we have some images that does not contain a person, for example, an animal, and we let the animal image in, to be fitted into the classifier, then the classifier will, will predict this animal as a person, which is very awkward. So in that case, we need a, person or the detector that detects anything that is not a person. Because person data is very sensitive, so we use dog images here uh, for demonstration. Um, so the problem here is that we assume our in-domain are all kinds of dog breeds and out-of-domain are anything that is not a dog. It can be cats, birds, cars, definitely anything not a dog. And in eval to evaluate this uh, problem, we consider the uh, 
a few very challenging scenarios. For example, we not only uh, evaluate on the known categories of in-domain and out-of-domain, we also consider evaluating the unknown categories because all the, they are following long tail distribution. So we want to evaluate on how well this model uh, perform on the unknown long tail or the categories. Besides that, we not only evaluate our natural images, we also consider the covariant shifting data like uh, painting of dog or a drawing of dog. We want <laughs> to see how well the model perform when the data is shifted. Uh, we also consider another challenging scenario, which is the multi-object mixed, mixed in-domain auto-domain uh, images. Suppose here, for example, there is this is a person with a, a boy with a dog. So this image contains both in-domain and out-of-domain objects. So this is quite a challenging task because those in-domain objects will lower the all these score. The, the, the whole OD score, so make this image hard to be classified. So we evaluated on all those challenging tasks. Previously, uh, we were using the sum of the probability over the OD set as the OD score. For this work, we explore more kinds of definitions of uh, OD score. For example, like maximum of the probability uh, within the in-domain classes, or the maximum of the logis over the out of domain minus the maximum of the logis over the in domain. We also consider one baseline, which does not assume the availability of all the label sets. But here I want to emphasize, I, I fully understand some people argue that it's expensive to obtain all the images. But uh, in my opinion, it's pretty cheap to obtain a set of all the labels. In this scenario, for example, it's very easy for us, us to get some all the like non dog labels like cats, birds, and so on. So I think uh, in that case, we should be able to use all the labels and we should use it to help us to get a better all the detection. Uh, this result shows that uh, using our newly proposed all the scores, we are able to detect both known and unknown, very good uh, performance, unknown and unknown all detection. Uh, we, we try different uh, one class problem like dog versus non-dog, car versus non-car, or person versus non-person. And uh, our newly proposed score here, you can see uh, is much better than the, the first row, which uh, corresponding to the baseline method that does not use all the labels. So you can see here it's very helpful for us to get uh, all the label set and uh, use it for all the detector. Uh, since this model is uh, the click model can take any form of text input. So uh, we discussed whether we should use a more uh, concrete OD label set like in the file grand level or we should use a more cross level uh, labels. And we found that using more grand, uh, five grand label set is more helpful for improving the performance. At the last, uh, here I mentioned we want to tackle the challenge of detecting mixed in and out uh, multi-object images. Um, so like this image with dog and cat, one is in domain, the other is out of domain. Those images are challenging because uh, those in domain objects object can lower the OD scores causing the image to be misclassified. Uh, we aim, our aim here is to flag those challenging mis mixed images. As you can see here, if we use our previously proposed single score, it's not possible to detect those mixed images. Then we propose that uh, we should use image segmentation and object detection for identify those uh, mixed images, uh, the object in the mixed images. We use the grounding Dino, this uh, advanced uh, segmentation model, to localize objects in the bounding boxes. And for each bounding box, we get a OD score. Then we define a mixed score, GX, uh, as the greatest score difference among all the bounding boxes. So for a mixed image, it will have at least one bounding box have a, become OD, and the other bounding box, uh, at least one bounding box is in domain then the difference between your OD score will be large. 
So in this way, we are able to better identify those uh, mixed images. And then um, people, once we have these mixed images, we can do some following uh, post process to identify those OOD objects. So in summary, um, we found this uh, clip model is a very powerful zero-shot OOD detector. And we show that uh, we can build a novel one-class open set OOD detector that leverage text image pre-trained models in a zero-shot fashion and incorporates various descriptions of in and out, uh, out of domain. In this work, we focus on more challenging and realistic settings to uh, evaluate our uh, long tail of unseen classes, distributional shifted images, and in-domain and out-of-domain mixed multi-object images. We show that our method is superior uh, over the baselines on those challenging benchmarks. Uh, if you are interested, uh, feel free to check our, uh, our method, uh, our details uh, on those uh, papers. Okay, since I have uh, a few minutes left, I want to uh, also discuss, um, uh, share a little bit of our work on authority estimation and the robustness of things. So why do we care about uncertainty estimation? Because besides the prediction, we also care when we should trust the model's prediction. Um, for example, for those distributional shifted data, we should expect the um, uncertainty score for those shifted data to be higher than the score for the long flow data. And also for, um, we also want to use the uncertainty score to indicate whether a prediction is wrong or not. So we should expect a wrong prediction have a higher uncertainty score than a correct prediction. Previously in the single model models like uh, image classifier, people often use softmax probability as a way to measure the uncertainty. <laughs> now we are in the new regime of text image models. How could we effectively estimate uncertainty? That's the question. Uh, one very interesting phenomenon we noticed is that the clip predictions are very sensitive to prompts. So a small perturbation or small change of the prompts actually can lead to very big performance difference. Here is one example. Uh, this is a flower data type for classification problem. If we use a prompt, a photo of a class, it achieves a 60% accuracy. But if we add the flower, the word flower to the prompt, immediately it gives us 5% boost. Similar thing happened to the satellite data. If we use a satellite photo of something, it gives us 7% boost over the baseline. So as you can see here, the prompt engineering and prompt selection are very important for a big model to be effectively used. And for different downstream tasks, we, can, we need to have a different prompt design uh, like specially designed for this uh, downstream task. Uh, in a separate work, we actually uh, discuss how to automatically select the prompts for a downstream task and how to effectively do the prompt ensemble. Uh, if you're interested, feel free to check out this paper. Yeah, so based on this observation that the prompts, uh, the peak predictions are very sensitive to prompts, we designed our uncertainty estimation method based on this intuition. Uh, we believe a high conflict prediction should be agnostic to prompts, which means uh, if this prediction is very reliable and solid, uh, the top one prediction of this uh, image should not be affected too much when we apply different prompts. So that, that's why we define a self-consistency score as an uncertainty, uncertainty score for uh, uncertainty estimation. So we have a set of prompts beforehand, and then we apply the prompt, each of the prompts to the prediction and see how many of them uh, have a different top one prediction score, uh, top one prediction other than the, uh, the case where we apply no prompt. In this way, we, are, uh, we get uh, uncertainty estimation. And you can see here, uh, using this newly proposed uncertainty score, we are better at detecting wrong predictions uh, apart from the correct predictions uh, compared with the previously logic-based scores. 
and we can use this score to help us to obtain, obtain, obtain a, low, a set of low confidence predictions and uh, make sure the remaining set has high prediction accuracy. But this is not the end of the story we want to explore. Because now we have a set of low confidence predictions, our next step is how could we, the question is how could we improve the performance, the prediction accuracy for those low, low confidence sets? We did some uh, failure case analysis and we found actually many of those uh, top one inaccurate predictions are uh, top five correct, which means their ground truths are among the top five predictions. So the question now is how could we re-rank the top five predictions to correct the top one prediction? And then we, we look at, uh, take, took a closer look at those errors and we found most of the errors are actually due to the label name either too broad or too narrow. Let me give you an uh, example. This is an image of a Tasker elephant. The ground truth label was only Tasker. So this, this image was often misclassified as Asian elephant. The reason is that this Tasker name, the name of the Tasker is too specific. It does not contain a superclass name elephant. Once we add the elephant to the Tasker name, then the error got fixed. Another failure case is uh, the one in the middle. Uh, this is a hot air balloon, but the label for the image that uh, data set was alone for this image. So this image was often misclassified as airship. <clears throat> so the reason for this misclassification is that this word balloon is too, too broad. It does not specify this particular hot air balloon. So once we replace the balloon with hot air balloon, then this error immediately got fixed. So uh, then we, based on the intuition, we came up with this top-down, bottom-up label augmentation method using WordNet, which is augment original class names with their ancestor and children using the WordNet hierarchy. And as you can see uh, on the low confidence set, we immediately got more than 17% Accuracy boost <coughs> and it fixed a lot of the error issue uh, due to the label uh, name. And then on the full set, we have 3%. This is true not only for ImageNet, but also for other ImageNet variant data sets and some uh, more fine grained downstream task data sets. Yeah, so in summary, uh, we propose an uncertainty estimation method that is better suited for text image models based on prediction self-consistency rate. We identify some failure modes uh, for the wrong predictions in the clip model. And many of them are due to class names either too broad or too narrow. Then based on that, we develop a label augmentation technique that uses both ancestors and children labels from WordNet. So by applying the label augmentation method to the low confidence set, we are able to significantly improve the prediction accuracy. Uh, this work was uh, is accepted by the CDPR, so we are going to present this work on Wednesday morning for the session. So if you want to learn more details of this work, feel free. Yeah, you're very welcome to our poster sessions. Mm, yeah. So the takeaway of my today's talk is that we believe the clip style image text uh, foundation model um, they are very good zero shot all detector. And we found that uh, we, we can build a powerful zero-shot O detector using outlier exposure and also build a very good uh, one-class open set O detector. And we found the text image models are sensitive to prompts. So we propose a way to uh, augment the label uh, names to make sure it's more robust. And we also have a separate work on uh, how to automatically uh, do prompt selection and prompt ensemble. Yeah, you can find all the papers in my website. Thank you very much. Uh, and last, I want to uh, thank my uh, collaborators at Google Research and Google DeepMind and my student researchers and interns from Stanford, uh, mainly Stan, Yunhao, and uh, James, um, for their mm -hmm. hard working and the very inspiring uh, work with us. Um, yeah, thanks again for the organizers for this very good uh, workshop at CDPR. Uh, now I can take 
questions. Thank you. Um, I guess you're, you're um, for, I, I'm not familiar with the paper, I haven't read, but it seems like you are, you have the OOD model, which is separate from the, the downstream model, whatever it ends up being. Um, do you see inconsistency between those models and this, that's problematic, like where both of them thinks that, that they're correct? And do you see a way of potentially coupling them together, like in training, training them together so that they're more consistent with each other? Um, yeah, that's fine. So can I repeat your question? Oh. <laughs> Make sure I'm, I'm understanding correct. So you are saying that I have some foundation model uh, to use. I also have some downstream tasks. Do I see the gap between the two? Or how do I uh, yeah. tackle the two? Yeah, like the OOD detector, maybe it's like an early stage in the pipeline. You run it and you see like, is is this in, in uh, yeah, in my, is it, how do you keep, okay, so more, how do you keep the OOD detector consistent with the, the more specific detection that you would do, I guess? Are they separate? So I think the whole idea of my talk today is that we actually can leverage the uh, text image clip style models for all detector. That's my uh, take home message. I feel like uh, it's a very powerful uh, foundation model and we can easily incorporate the uh, label, our OD labels into this model because it has a text encoder. And this is very helpful for our OD detector because we can easily, uh, we don't need to train or fine tune any model for the specific OD data. What we only need is uh, just to bring the OD labels to this new shot classifier. And then the, la the OD label uh, plays a very important role to help the model to get a better decision boundary between in and out. And uh, I have tried um, the model on like small scale, like CIFAR, or also uh, on ImageNet large scale data set. And I see this uh, model perform pretty well on all those tests. I also actually tested it on my uh, on Google internal um, like applications. So I found um, this is a very good model to use. Um, so that's my typical message. And I think uh, if we have a specific downstream task, uh, we definitely can fine tune this model uh, on a specific task, but um, fine tuning requires a lot of computation because the model size is very large. Um, I don't know how much gain we can get uh, or whether it's very effective or worth doing for that uh, since this new shot setting is already pretty good in my opinion. Thank you. Great talk. Like, I don't you know, I have a stupid question, maybe. <laughs> like, no uh, for, like, when you detect the uh, OD based on your score, so I have personally observed that it's quite sensitive to the type code, like, because you can report the. Yeah, AURC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, for different tasks, so it's hard, like, which type code to use. Yeah. Um... Yeah, then your question is, uh, yeah, how do we choose a threshold? Yeah. So for example, in normal, you don't have to do all the, all the stuff yeah. like testing. And the uh, second question was, when you do this uncertainty estimation yeah. with the prompts, how do you select the prompts? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, so there are two questions. Thanks for your question. The first question is, um, we basically assign all this score for each of the test input. So when we, um, in the real application, how do we decide the threshold to uh, determine uh, whether this is OD or D? Uh, my, um, my practice, uh, in my practice, I often refer to some actual data so that you can get, uh, so based on the requirement, sometimes people require uh, uh, like high, like high true positive rate or low false positive rate 
or high precision and, and those kind of criteria. So based on the criteria, I decide how to choose the threshold. Uh, so different application they have different requirements. Some 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 application really want to detect have a high recall rate. So then we want to recall all the OD uh, as much as possible. Some application really care about the precision. So in that case, we want to make sure we have a high uh, low false discovery rate. So that's my uh, two cents <laughs> to this. You can have some uh, separate uh, validation set for the particular application case. <laughs> and for the second question, you were asking uh, how could we select the fund? In fact, they select the fund that is suitable for a downstream test. Uh, I haven't, I didn't mention this work. Uh, this is a recent work we have done uh, for automatically fund selection and the fund ensemble. So there we create some confidence score. Uh, same similar kind of idea. Like we create some confidence score for each prompt. We want to use this confidence score to indicate whether this prompt is relevant to this downstream task or not. And then we, uh, instead of using an uh, equal average of all the prompts, like what uh, the clip paper was doing, like they create 80 prompts and they equally weight all the 80 prompts for their prediction. What we did was like we create uh, we propose a confidence score for each prompt, and then we do the uh, weighted average. Uh, we weight more on the more important prompts than the less important important prompts. The idea for how do we how did we design the confidence score is uh, based on uh, uh, how much after applying this prompt, how much cosine similarity we can get again. again uh, by applying this uh, a prompt applied text with the image. So how much gain we see after we apply, uh, apply this prompt, uh, how much more similarity we can see uh, for this prompt with the uh, downstream task images. You know, yeah, <laughs> hope I make it clear. So uh, yeah, this is something I didn't uh, got time to present, but uh, if you want to know more details, I can uh, explain it to you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I think we have. I think we have one more uh, time for one more question here. Then I think there was one. Well, one line, yeah. So yep. we maybe can. Okay. Now, yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much for the for the talk and also. Um, so my my question relates to 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 my colleague. Um, I have seen uh, uncertainty estimated uh, via, for example, dropout. Uh, <coughs> dropout, yes. For yes, example, you can estimate then, uh, then uncertainty of, a, of an image classifier. And here you um, you manipulate the prompt, right? Yes. And, and by manipulating the prompt, you mm -hmm. get the uncertainty. But I've not seen uh, a, an end to end estimation of uncertainty. Um, end to end. Do you have any? Thought on that. So, yeah. people you use uh, as a pre trained uh, functional yeah, model, I guess it's not quite easy. So, this is a zero shot way for um, as, uh, estimate uncertainty. You are talking about whether we have some way to uh, incorporate the uncertainty estimation during the training, right? Into the model. Into so the that model. Yeah, yeah. Also the uncertainty. Are you aware of any start in this direction uh, or? Yes. So, um, actually, we explored a little bit on that. Uh, so at the beginning, when we explore uncertainty estimation, we were thinking about the way you mentioned, like uh, incorporate some probabilistic layer into the model. But we found uh, training the model really too expensive <laughs> to us to do. And uh, the training really needs to, because uh, this is contrasting learning, it requires a very large um, memory. It uh, requires a very large batch size. The thousands, of, like, uh, batch size can be 1,000 and so on. So it really requires a lot of computational resources. And uh, we trained a little bit, but we didn't see very promising uh, result yet. So then we were looking at this, uh, we were studying this sensitivity in the prompts to image rotations or like image, augment, image augmentation <coughs> of the prompt perturbation. And we found this model is super sensitive to prompt than an image perturbation. Uh, so that's why we define this uh, score based on that, and we found this uh, pretty effective. And this is the short one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much.
Okay, so we have a question from online, um, which is, do you have any suggestion about how to adapt the clip model in industrial data sets like MVTEC, which have large gaps between that and natural image data sets? Yeah. Oh. I, I need to learn more about this, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so actually uh, I'm new to this uh, anomaly detection field. Uh, today actually is a very good learning for me. Uh, I, I found there uh, a new problem uh, that is to detect the anomalous objects within an image. I didn't explore this field previously. So I was thinking uh, uh, for this, how to use a flip model for this setting. I was actually thinking maybe image segmentation is the first step to use. And then for each segmented object, we can apply the flip score. To that. that that's my first uh, intuition <laughs> about this uh, because nowadays I I feel like the segmentation model is very powerful so it's um, it's not a bottleneck anymore for segment images so maybe first a segment image and then uh, for each object we detect or each bounding box then we apply this keep all detector uh, maybe that's it the way uh, but I uh, it's, it's new to me. I need to explore it. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I want to try to. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. J, for your interesting talk. Uh, next, we have a last and final spotlight. Um, it's titled SANO Score Based Anomaly Detection Based on Diffusion Score. Sorry. Um, it's a very interesting uh, talk for multiple reasons. One of them is this is our uh, spotlight in the medical domain, and also they take a different approach in solving anomaly detection using diffusion-based models. Um, thank you. Uh, I know I'm hand it over to you. I hope uh, can you hear me well. <coughs> so uh, I'm Alvaro Gonzalez. Uh, today I'm going to present our work, uh, SANO, a score-based diffusion model for anomaly localization in the methodology. Uh, this is a joint collaboration between the University of Basel and uh, Oxford Lutheran in, in Switzerland. So, for you to have an idea about uh, our group, we our vision is to develop a system that can provide a differential diagnosis uh, for the skin lesions and also to objectively quantify the area where the lesion is, uh, how much the lesion is affected. So most of the, the works relies on the supervised deep learning. So a lot of annotated data. And as uh, my previous colleagues uh, mentioned, in dermatology, we have a long tail distribution. So for common diseases, we have multiple images, but for rare conditions, we just have few some. So this motivates us to use uh,
So, uh, so yeah, I, I was saying uh, this motivates us to uh, this anomaly localization because uh, healthy skin samples are very easy to obtain. We just need to click the features from the healthy people and just do some anomaly localization on them. Another problem that we have is the training diversity. So in our group, as you can see, most of the images are from uh, low pigmented skin, so white people. So we don't have images for weak pigmented skin. So this is one of the problems that we have. The second problem is the uncontrolled condition. So in dermatology, you have a lack of standardization of the of the images with different angle, different contrast, different light. So Reconstruction-based models uh, for doing anomaly localization do not yield uh, good results, and uh, this would not be satisfactory for us. A good alternative would be to use the gradients of the local liquid with respect to the input values because they tend to be higher for those areas that are, are anomalous with respect to the training data. So this is like the key idea of our work. So we directly model the low quality gradients uh, using the score based diffusion model. So briefly to explain how, how does it work, we have the data distribution of our, our healthy data, and we noise the data following a stochastic process. So this is the forward step. And to reverse this process from the noise to the data, you need to estimate uh, those gradients, which we define as uh, the score function. So for this, you need to train a model to estimate the gradients, and this is what we use later to localize the, the anomalies. So the first step is to estimate the gradients. In this case, we use uh, a time step zero. We don't need to noise the data, and this is just a simple forward step. So computationally talking is very efficient. The second step is to combine the gradients. So we combine across the color channels, and we apply some Gaussian Kalman's motion to improve the area where the lesion is located, and finally some thresholding. So in case that you don't have a validation set to calculate the thresholding, we use uh, a strategy which is very simple. Uh, basically, you apply a number of standard deviation from the from the gradients, and those are the, the values are anomalous. So we did two experiments for uh, dermatology. The first one was for youth relocalization. We use this uh, public data set of uh, hands. So there are 11,000 hands of uh, 190 subjects. And uh, we manually cemented all the mass for drug rate. So the idea of the objective was to A, train on hands that doesn't contain any drug rate, any accessory, and then later on identify the drug rate. As you can see, uh, Simon gives the best results across different baselines, the reconstruction based model. Some of the Qualitative samples that you can see here are uh, from two different images. This is the second best uh, model. It doesn't reconstruct all the, the rings. Some can actually obtain the good segmentation map, and this is the, the ground truth. And the second step was uh, data shift uh, or distribution and shift. So we use the same model, but in this case, in a clinical data. So the data that in this case that we use for, for eczema localization. So we have a private data set from the University Hospital of Basel in which the patients come and they take a picture in a very sunrise way from the palm and dorsal side. And we use the same model as it was before, in this case for localizing the same one. As you can see, the results are not that good as before, but still is very competitive against the, the different baseline. Some of the results that you can see here, probably uh, the image is not that great. Uh, the redness on the, on the images are clearly identified by some, not only in the permanent side, but also in the fingertips. So as a takeaway, uh, SAMO is the right way to perform localized graded anomaly localization using diffusion models, so we don't need to do any reconstruction. The second step is uh, compared to the other baselines, we obtain very uh, competitive results, especially in the uh, domain shift. SAMO can improve clinical data acquisition workflows uh, by directing on wanted objects. So this is an important step in uh, our clinic because we need to reduce the privacy of the bias of the, of the model. We cannot have images that can identify the patient, such as rings or breast marks. And finally, some of the diagnosis and diagnosis in this localization for automatic severity quantification. 
So that was our paper. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I guess your presentation was very clear. That they didn't have any interest. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, um, so as a part of our workshop, we organized a challenge, um, the van challenge. Um, so now I'll ask um, one of our challenge organizers, Yang, to present um, some, a brief introduction of what the challenge is about. We can take it here. I'll come to that one of the new things. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for me and my colleagues, Taiwan, to give the overview and the summary of the Van 2023 challenge. So, the Van workshop or challenge aims to encourage the research in the foundation model for industrial zero destruction. So, I think the figure three talks are completed, and uh, Jason also mentioned a lot of them. Uh, so, we expanded the foundation model for industrial zero destruction. <laughs> To have an accurate anomaly recognition gauging with zero or few normal samples. So uh, it alleviated the pain points of the generalization across uh, objects. Uh, so for feasibility study, so we have some uh, pioneer groups called uh, Quinkit, which is accepted to uh, CHR industry. So it uh, demonstrated that table is, is very powerful for zero short or few short anomaly recognition. So accordingly, we have two tracks in the chain. First is the zero short anomaly detection, and the second is few short anomaly detection. So let's talk about the, the benchmark setups. So for data sets in phase one, which is for initial model event, so we use the ME tag AD data set. In phase two, which is the main challenge track, we use the modified public visa data set with a, a lot of uh, data transformation. Uh, in terms of metrics, in zero short track, we use an aggregated F1 max, uh, which is a harmonic mean of classification F1 max and the segmentation F1 max. In few short track, uh, we compute the aggregated F1 max per one, five, ten shorts, and uh, we use the array under the F1 max curve as a final metric. Now I will ask my colleague Taiwan to present the summary of the channel. Okay, so we have some, some brief statistics that I will see from the time. So first, we have like 14 participants who joined both free shot and zero shot track, and overall we have like 23 people who joined the track. So thank you all for one again. And also these are some scores that we observe for both zero shot and free shot track of course 
outline and curriculum and you can see these are our uh, baseline uh, models of uh, models for uh, from P3 and P plus. But yeah, amazingly, someone beat our model in two days for zero shot and uh, kind of in a week in two shots. So really appreciate your work, hard work and time. And then we're gonna start now to meet winners of the tracks. So first, uh, the runner-up of the zero shot track is segment ending and move. And yeah, please give a round of applause for the second year of the Good answer, Dr. Tony. Thank you for coming over and handle the conversation to the winners. Oh, that was your turn. Yeah, I'm going to start with the first one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you come up to the stage to receive your certificates? Okay, okay we'll move on. Can you please come over? Yeah, I'm representing the office. Thanks uh, for the to the organizers for hosting this conference for giving us the opportunity to make the most important sites for the background to the slides to the and on that call, we have a So, yeah. So, I can also hear another one who also invest the So, there is the standard for tech one data and the brain for both of the And thanks also, April Gang for two questions. And today we saw here some leaderboards. So these numbers are actually on our website. So you can just you know the numbers and thanks for all the participants who joined our podcast at all the time. Thanks, Yang and Devan, for the introduction to the challenge. Um, now we're going to have presentations from the challenge winners, starting with zero short track. Um, first up, we have presentation from um, April Gang. It will get to the start of presentation. Um, hello, I won um Shi Haichen from April again. I'm delighted that our team uh, emerged as the winner in the zero shot track. The links to our technical report and code are at the top right. Oh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, Could you restart again because we weren't ready with the audio? Oh okay. Start with So you can just start sharing the screen again and then just begin to talk. We are ready now with the audio as well. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reshare. Uh, Oh, 
Oh is this all right? Uh, is the slide? Oh, um, okay. Now uh, I'm I'm going to start. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Xu Haichen from April again. I'm delighted that our team emerged as a winner in the zero short track. Uh, the links to our technical report and code are at the top right of this slide. Uh, this achievement was a collaborative effort between myself, Yue Han, and Jiang Ningzhang. Both Yue Han and I are master's students at Zhejiang University, while Jiang Ningzhang is a researcher at Tencent due to lab. Uh, next, I'll introduce our solutions for anomaly classification and segmentation separately. Um, the aim of zero-shot anomaly classification is to figure out if there's any anomaly in the test, te test images, um, even without any training examples. Regarding this task, we went with a solution that's quite similar to the one-clip model proposed by the organizers of this challenge. We owe them a big thanks for giving us this uh, inspiration. Uh, basically, we used the uh, clip model uh, which can classify images based on text prompts. We regard anomaly classification as a binary classification task and define both normal and abnormal text prompts. Um, to further improve the detection accuracy, we use a uh, a uh, text uh, a prompt ensemble strategy includes both a state and template level. For the state level, we adapt to generic text such as uh, flawless and damage to de describe the normal and abnormal objects. For the template level, we screen the 85 temp uh, templates in clip for ImageNet and uh, remove some templates that are not suitable for AD. Um, then we combine the templates and states into uh, text prompts uh, and pass all the text prompts through the clip uh, text encoder. After that. Uh, after that, we calculate the average features separately for uh, normal and abnormal cases to perform text prompt example. Um, finally, we calculate the similarity between image features and text features in the joint embedding space and use the similarity between image features and abnormal text as an anomaly score. Uh, the joint embedding space refers to a space where image features and text features are aligned. Uh, when it comes to zero-shot anomaly segmentation, I'll explain using the clip model based on vision transformer as an example. Uh, our method can be easily extended to other uh, architectures as well. Uh, specifically, we rethink the pipeline of the clip model for a zero shot classification task. Uh, for the image encoder, we notice that only the features corresponding to the class token are used. Uh, while the features corresponding to the patch tokens are being overlooked. Uh, These unused features contain spatial information about the images. Uh, this gets us thinking if we can calculate the similarity between the text features and the features corresponding to uh, the uh, patch tokens, we can easily obtain the anomaly map, which is essentially the segmentation result. However, we encounter a challenge here because during the training process of the clip model, the features corresponding to patch tokens are not mapped into the joint embedding space. In other words, the text features cannot be directly compared with these features. As we know, the mapping between two linear spaces is achieved through a a linear transformation, which is essentially a, a simple linear layer. Thus, our idea is to address this by adding a simple linear layer that maps the features of this uh, patch tokens into the joint embedding sp space. Then we compare the mapped features with the text features to obtain the designed anomaly map. Uh, additionally, we find that features at different levels are crucial for anomaly segmentation. 
Therefore, we divided all the layers of the vision transformer into four stages with an equal number of layers in each stage. Uh, then we uh, calculate an anomaly map for each stage uh, and sum them up to obtain the uh, final results. Um, due to the requirement of a ground truth anomaly map for training the linear layers, and considering that the official test set is a modified version of the visa, we use the Amitech AD test set for training. Uh, here are the results on the leaderboard. Our method significantly outperforms others in terms of uh, an anomaly segmentation although it shows slightly lower performance in anomaly classification. Uh, we also conduct experiments on standard data sets like VESA and uh, Amitech AD. Please refer to our technical report for more details. Um, here are the uh, viral re results on the official test data set. It demonstrates that our model not only uh, accurately localizes all anomalies, but also have uh, a very few uh, false detections. However, for more challenging categories like PCB, uh, there are still cases where some normal components are considered anomalies, uh, indicating room for improvement in the model's performance. Uh, we also notice that when the objects in the the image have prominent shadows. The model uh, may assign a certain anomaly score to those shadowed areas. This might be because the objects in the Amitech AD dataset don't have clear uh, shadows. Uh, this phenomenon indicates a gap between the training and testing. We will continue to explain, uh, explore this in the future if anyone is interested in uh, having more in-depth discussions, uh, discussions with us, we are more than happy to welcome you. Um, thank you for your attention. Here are the uh, QR codes for our lab home homepage, uh, technical report and code. Please feel free to contact us even after this workshop. I'm mm, really looking forward to make new friends. Uh, and that's all, thanks again. Any questions from the audience? So, um, from my current understanding, these methods are always limited by the unavailability of a joint vision language feature space of high spatial resolution. Um, have you tried looking at other methods like SecClip or other approaches that exist to, to go there? Or, um, I mean, it's still impressive work just for me to, to know if there's something else. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, I, I, can, I can't hear you uh, clearly. Please, uh, could you please uh, speak a, a little bit slower? And, and I, will I will try to listen clearly. Sorry for that. So, so you proposed a, a linear layer to map or to, to achieve a um, joint vision language space of high spatial resolution. Um, have you also considered maybe in the initial stages some uh, adapting other works uh, like uh, SecClip or ClipSec um, that try to achieve the same for natural images? Um. Uh, sorry, I, I still can't hear clearly, and um, um, I, I just I just understand that you you have the you have questions about our uh, linear layers. Um, we 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 use the linear layers to map the uh, features of uh, patch tokens to the joint embedding space. Oh, uh, this space refers to the space that the image features and text features are uh, aligned. Um, and, uh, 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 and if maybe maybe you can contact me uh, mm -hmm. after this workshop. Yeah, I, I really can't hear clearly. So really sorry for that. 
I think we have one question in the chat, if I see correctly. Yeah, you got it in front of you, or do you want to? So, um, uh, oh, sorry. See? Oh, you can you can type the question in the in the chat chat, and I'll I'll type type and answer. That's a possible way, maybe. I think we have an additional question. So, <coughs> can you see uh, how many images are needed for retraining the proposed algorithm? The, the backbone size yeah. is three, right? Uh, uh, sorry, I okay. Could, could you please say it again? Are you, uh, you, you are asking this question in the chat. Oh, uh, on, the, on the chat, okay. Yeah, if you open the chat, I think it's the... Uh... Oh, okay. It's how, many, how many images is needed for retraining the proposed uh, agri algorithm? Uh, yes, the backbone is phrase, and uh, we use the whole test set of MATAC AD to uh, retraining the uh, four linear layers. Stephen, uh, thanks again for your talk. So we move on to the next one. I think the next one is also virtual, right? Oh, yeah, the next one is on virtual. So next up, we have a presentation from Segment Any Anomaly. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, so let's begin. Oh, wait a moment. Uh, hello, everyone. It's my great, great pleasure to present my solution for zero short term detection here. I'm Yun Kang Tao from Huashan University of Science and Technology. And the previous team from Zhejiang University has elaborated their solution. Here, I'd like to bring everyone's attention back to a simple question. That's how to identify anomalies in arbitrary images. Give me an example. It's easy for human, for us to represent the anomalies with the overlong wig or the hole on white surface or red paint on wood or yellow oil on tile. That's language descriptions help to express anomalies precisely. And we can detect anomalies with language probes. And thanks to recent advances on regional language foundation models, we can detect regions using uh, language descriptions, giving image test, uh, image test as inputs. The grounding dino model can detect the detected objects in a bounding box form. And furthermore, recommend anything. That model is a recent and highly popular foundation model. It could uh, further refine bounding box predictions into pixel level masks, which could be further utilized for anomaly segmentation. Um, considering grounding dino and SAM, we can easily get a vanilla solution, which we call segment any anomaly, SAA. That's giving the inspecting image and the naive language probe anomaly. We can use grounding dino to generate anomaly uh, bounding box candidates. And then we can refine them with SAM to get fixed level prediction. Uh, however, as shown in the prediction result, we can see that SA wrongly predict all weeks as abnormal, whereas only in the overlong week is the bad one. That's SAA suffers from severe photo alarm. And in the other world, foundation model assembly is not all you need. We attribute the underlying obstacle for the severe false alarms to the language ambiguity in two aspects. Firstly, there is a large do domain gap between training data sets and the target data sets. We would like to fill this gap using domain expert knowledge. Secondly, the word anomaly is an object dependent word. And thus, it will represent different contexts in different objects. To address this issue, the target image context should be introduced to further determine the meaning of anomaly. 
And considering human intuition in identifying anomalies, the hybrid clues that could contribute. Uh, firstly, human experts have the capacity to predict potential anomalies in a given object according to their past experience. Hence, we can introduce more detailed anomaly descriptions as the language proposed, such like is a golden bite or contamination. And secondly, like the detailed language descriptions, experts could usually talk about the properties about anomalies. These properties are valuable for filtering out false alarms. These two clues are summarized as domain expert knowledge. And thirdly, giving an image, we usually determine an abnormal region according to its salience. Thus, an uh, abnormal region usually differs from its neighbors. And moreover, the number of anomalies within an image is typically limited. And these clues are derived from the target image context. And mimicking the hybrid clues in human infection process, we further formulate them into our framework, segment any anomaly class. In domain for knowledge, we propose language propose PL and the property propose PP. And using target image context, we propose salience propose and confidence proposed. And here is the overall framework for our revamped uh, solution. And for more technical details, please refer to our technical reports. For evaluation, we use two metrics, peak level max FY score and the region level and max FY score. And we can see that our proposed DSA plus achieves state of the art performance on four widely used data sets. And the significantly outperforms the given baseline wind leap. Also, compared to the nearest foundation model assembly, SA plus, which incorporating hybrid proposed, achieved about 15% FP higher. And there is a visualization result. So you can see that our proposed method achieved excellent anomaly segmentation performance and notably we achieved nearly perfect performance on texture categories. And here we further conduct a series of application study. And in short, every proposed contributes. Although our method could achieve impressive, impressive performance, it may fail in some cases. Uh, for example, when the inspection objects contain complex normal elements, it will be harder for foundation models to detect the true positive candidates. Also, it seems that the foundation models rely on boundaries to detect or refine predictions. Hence, when defect boundary is not clear, the proposed method will fail. And moreover, the proposed method focused on detecting foreground objects and will be a fail in detecting logical anomalies such as, such as missing objects and we will investigate them in the future. And thanks for listening. Welcome any form of cooperation. Also, I am looking forward for a post PhD position in 2025. If you have any interest in my work, please do not hesitate to contact me. And now I can, now I can take questions. Thank you. There was one that says hi, it's an interesting idea. Uh, yeah, so we have one question. I just read it out loud in case you. You, you can uh, see. Uh, I, I see a question from the chat. Yeah, there's a question from the chat. I will just read it out loud for the audience here because we cannot see it. Um, so, hi, it's an interesting idea to transform the intermediate representation of the grid model to localize anomalies. Did you try any experiments to see which intermediate layer contributed the most to the localization performance? Uh, to be honest, in some categories, this may be very sensitive. For example, in the texture categories in the MWTEC AD, 
The grounding dyno usually detects the whole image as a desired object. And in these cases, we usually use an area threshold uh, smaller than one to, uh, to detect the desired region. And in, in, in other categories, maybe the, it's, I simply set all the area threshold into uh, 0.3. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from the audience here? There is one more online. Ah, one more online, okay. Please wait one more question from the chat. So from your view, it seems the property prompts seem to be the most important refining component. Did you try to investigate how sensitive these prompts were to exact numbers uh, used? Such as changing the IU threshold or expected anomaly area. Uh, yes, I think I just have answered this question. Okay, sorry. Can I repeat the question? You can see it in the chat as well. So, the last message. Uh, I mean, in my method, uh, for some categories like the uh, texture categories in MV Tech AD, the threshold may be sensitive. And in most categories, I just simply set the area threshold into 0 0.3. And uh, this doesn't mean to anything. Okay, so thank you very much again for a nice talk. Uh, we'll continue yes, now with the first presentations. Yes, it's your turn now. Next up, we have the winner of the future uh, challenge chat. Uh, the team name is Cortex. I'm not showing the right slides. It's not showing the right slides. It's showing that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm looking to the document of the or. Yes, oh, much better now. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you for um, having us here. I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, hosting this challenge. Um, team name is Gotek uh, because we are from a company, and um, while I more or less supervise the work, the main effort and contributions were made by Joao and Thier. So, um, big shout outs to them to uh, also making uh, this happen and uh, having us demonstrate that we are actually good at what we do. Um, Maybe why this uh, challenge is of interest to us. Um, quick introduction to the company. We sell basically automated optical inspection systems, um, which do have something to do with anomaly detection because we require only a few normal images for uh, training. Um, and uh, basically, we are international um, companies located in Paris, France, which is why everything is in French there. But I myself am, am German and working in a hybrid model. Um, so uh, one of the requirements that we have, um, or that we have mainly, and that's mostly developed or propelled uh, our design of our solution, is um, that this thing needs to run fast and train fast on an embedded system. So uh, that means that we aren't really in a position to train complex uh, neural networks on a per uh, on a per data set basis. So uh, that's not really there. Um, we uh, also hypothesize that techniques which improve few-shot transfer learning will also improve few-shot anomaly detection. So 
image level augmentations or feature level augmentations and single supervised learning. And um, yeah, we also hypothesize that the hyperparameters of current Photoshop uh, solutions are overfitted to the VTEC AV data set a bit, and that a lot of performance gains can be improved by doing proper um, hyperparameter optimization here. Because, yeah, um, anything like if you ever see a benchmark and you see more than 95 or 98 percent, percent of the in theory. Uh, reachable performance i would say you always should be um, hesitant to, to or these things need to then be demonstrated uh, demonstrate their value on other additional data sets so that was the assumption that we had um so uh yeah we didn't develop anything new or super fancy um we stick to the simple stuff that worked well which is uh, then if everything boils down to use more or less patch course so key nearest neighbor Based anomaly detection, which we've already heard a lot about, um, with optimized hyperparameters and data augmentations. And uh, now, basically, um, since we also mainly looked at the feature extractor and the scale, and we already had a very nice presentation on this, I would say that we were both uh, teams thinking along the, the uh, correct or like uh, synonymous lines. We did it uh, autonomously. So, um, yeah, the approach is really to, to investigate influence of different uh, hyperparameters. And um, these are now uh, reported on public visa data sets, um, segmentation and uh, yeah, segmentation metrics and um, image level uh, anomaly detection metrics. Uh, some insights that we gained uh, in the uh, process of the challenge is basically that the choice of feature extractor and input resolution had the biggest impact. So I guess we are more or less 100% aligned with the colleagues from MBTEC. Which investigated this in the in the full shot on MBTEC AD, and we investigated it in a few shots uh, setting on MBTEC and uh, Visa. So more challenging data set. Um, something to keep very much uh, note of is that actually using more um, a strong reductive bias into the CNN, so into the pre-trained feature extractor, was crucial to achieve good anomaly detection and segmentation performances. So if you compare the uh, anti-aliased white resonant with the typical aliased white uh, resonant um, or with, with the typical uh, resonant, which isn't shown here, uh, which should be shown or will be shown in, in, the, in the report, but basically um, if we uh, are Traditional plans for learning tells us that better image net classification yields more geographically applicable feature representations. So, network architectures that should be better on image net, like convex and efficient as before, should be better at non detection or in, in general trends for learning. And this has been shown to also hold a bit for um, the uh, automated optical inspection um, challenge. And here, actually, we, we see that this is no longer the case. And um, that's something that should be addressed or could be addressed in future. I guess it has to, some parts potentially to do with the with the shifts and the translations that were added to the test set of Visa. Um, image level augmentation itself not, not speak consistently. They help also notably the most for um, anomaly segmentation. And uh, we did not get feature level augmentations to work. So um, image level means that you have to include the main expert knowledge, and that's kind of like not so nice as we've seen with virtual outlier synthesis. Um, there is some some room for potential room for improvements by going into the intermediate feature representations. Um, and this didn't work. Also to, to share with you what didn't work. Uh, model ensemble helps surprisingly, and core sets of sampling is complementary to image level augmentations because you can basically scale uh, the augmentations and um, can reduce them, reduce your or keep the same topology and actually. Um, we believe that there is some noise uh, removal properties inherent to greedy process selection um, that allow you to, to filter out some noise samples. So uh, that helps uh, also not only speeding up the stuff, but also improving the performance. And uh, to refute the claim that we've now optimized separate parameters on Lisa, these are the graphs for MBTEC, and we see that also for MBTEC, anti aliased wide resonance are um, the best. The gap is no longer as big. But it's still there. Yeah, um, we are planning to to post a white paper on this. Um, stay tuned and uh, shamelessly pitching from my own some challenges that we see in when actually trying to deploy these systems um, that uh, I want to share with the community. And feel free if you have any ideas, insights to come up to me to discuss, uh, because I think this is also what these workshops are all about. 
And what we see when deploying these systems, um, that uh, it is one main thing is that anomaly detection methods are too sensitive, also to variations of normal data, such as dust and fibers, which are there when you actually deploy and are not there if you're in a clean lab. Um, this yields false positives. Now you could say, okay, well, we will just add it to the call set. Spoiler alert, it doesn't work. So um, there's some, some insights to be gained on the topology here, on the distribution of the false positives, because for some it works. So if you have something like a, a red light, it works, but for these kind of uh, dusty and uh, particles, it doesn't work nearly as well. And uh, yeah, actually, if you, if you do ever patch core and do not do center cropping, you will see that toothbrush is not solvable as well by this algorithm. So this is uh, something that where we unfortunately did, or it's one of the reasons or one case where you see that you tune then on the data set uh, because doing center cropping proves this. And second, um, which actually sparked uh, our use of anti-aliased uh, CNN is that we observe a very strong influence of part positioning on the actual inspection outcome. So both translations and rotations um, largely affect our uh, products and what we sell. And this is something that's uh, quite inconvenient and we are trying to look forward to solving and uh, we will be spending a lot of time on anti aliasing stuff and also on working on rotation and variant uh, features. Um, from CNNs, and if anyone has encountered similar stuff or has some insights that they want to share, um, feel free. And I think, uh, yeah, developing other new um, evaluation schemes where we do this synthetically on, on current data sets or acquiring new data sets will be a further benefit for the community. Um, that's it, and thank you all for your attention. You talk about model ensemble in your uh, presentation. Can you elaborate a little bit? Because you mentioned that it took out. Um, what sort of model ensemble? Uh, uh, what we did is basically we found our model ensemble means that we combine uh, the pre trained representations from different feature extractors, something that's been done already by the original uh, authors of the patch for paper. They did it in the full shot regime, and um, in the few shot, it also helps. Um, and this points at the fact that there might be complementary information in there. So, uh, yeah, I, I see a lot of time uh, people doing single model, model knowledge distillation, like asynchronous student teachers. Um, something we, we uh, what could be done is to also do multi model knowledge distillation to try and get that to not have the cost of running to uh, feature extractor backbones. I have a question. Do you technically have any intuition why the feature uh, space augmentation did not work out? Um, well, actually, the, the question is how do you uh, then um, augment the space? So we looked at the augmentations that were used for semi supervised learning, and this is then um, either assume a, a Gaussian ensemble from this. So um, I think there. Like it, it goes a bit in line with the with the priors that we need. So we you need to make some assumptions, but uh, K and N is like the the freest assumption that you have with respect to the topology that the normal data should follow. So it's it's kind of um, a bit of hand and an egg problem, I would say. Thank you for your presentation. Next up, we have a presentation from.
where all objects are accurately segmented. This showcases the effectiveness of the approach in handling complex things with varying objects. Finally, we present the anomaly detection segmentation visualization results. These results demonstrate our method for efficiency in segmenting different anomalies on various objects. So in summary, our proposed multi-scale memory comparison network address the limitation of existing zero and view shot anomaly detection method in complex industrial detection things by incorporating two memory banks and employing a comprehensive methodology, we enhance anomaly detection capacities in many complex things and uh, with indefinite other numbers and uh, complex structures. So these are our team members. Welcome to contact us if there are any questions. Uh, that's all. Thanks for your listening. I'm only a speaker on behalf of the author. So, yeah, I may not fully understand the whole method. So, if you got uh, any questions, you can directly email the email author. Thank you again. So we reached the end of our workshop. Um, so thank you, everybody, um, all uh, organizers, invited speakers, program committee members, um, everyone who presented, spotlights, posters, submitted, reviewed. Um, thanks a lot. And if you have any feedback, um, please feel free to provide your feedback. So there is a QR code on our website. Um, session or any ideas about you know some sort of uh, workshops for the visual anomaly detection. Thank you everybody and have a good afternoon.